Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second part of the Mini School on Inequality. Um, the first part that was given by Peter was, uh, um, let's, say, let's call it the positive part, and today it's going to be mostly normative. So it's going to be about criteria of um, fairness and how to look at inequalities from a normative perspective. And therefore, um, as a disclaimer, I should say that um, uh, as a theorist, I don't take any questions about uh, the real world because I know virtually nothing about it. Um, and um, as a second piece of disclaimer is I'm going to present stuff that is um, shamelessly mine and shamelessly not mine. Um, work with co-authors, but also uh, as you will see in the third part, um, work by others. It's um, three loosely connected themes. The idea was to, since your PhD students, is to uh, try and um, expose you to stuff that is now currently ongoing and research projects that are being put forward rather than things that are sort of established in the literature. So. The three loosely connected themes that are going to be um, central in the whole um, lecture are the following. So one is what. So as you may remember from Sen, the big question is equality of what. And this is one of the things uh, that is going to be analyzed, i.e. the so-called distribuendum, the thing that uh, whose distribution we care uh, about. The second question is, why? What is the justification for some sort of inequality? Especially because, as we know, very often um, trying to enforce equality has a cost in terms of efficiency. So if we face that trade-off, how could we justify um, a concern for inequality? And finally, the third question is going to be how? How do we implement some uh, distributions that we deem fair? Uh, especially in situations in which we cannot use the welfare theorems and therefore we can't use markets to allocate um, efficiently. Now, um, the mainstream answers to these questions are in, in my view, limited in, in the following sense. Um, there is a huge emphasis on welfare as the key uh, variable, one way or another. So there is a huge so-called welfareistic emphasis uh, and looking at welfare as the key thing whose distribution cares, uh, we care about. Um, and the second thing is there is a huge preeminence of just a few criteria. Typically, the utilitarian criterion as the way to look at distributions of welfare. Now, the whole point of the three um, one-hour lectures is to explore different uh, alternative views about things that are relevant uh, to distribute and um, different criteria to evaluate uh, distributions. So, starting with the basics, well, not even the basics, but anyway, um, opportunities as chances. One of the first movements away from a welfareistic emphasis was Sen, and then actually from uh, 1971, Rawls, and the idea of focusing on primary goods. And from that, there was this huge literature on equality of opportunities. As you may know, a great part of this literature is about uh, the distinction between circumstances and effort. People think uh, things that people can control and things that are not, um, that people cannot control. Now, in this paper, we're going to uh, propose a slightly different view of opportunities, and we're going to analyze opportunities as chances. Uh, the key insight being that the um, literature on equality of opportunity is extremely rigorous, interesting, philosophically well-founded, but very, very difficult to implement, especially if you think about the information needed in order to uh, discern what are people's circumstances and uh, the amount of effort they put in, etc. So... What do we mean? Well, let's start with just a simple case. 
of a possible allocation of relevance. So you're on a climbing expedition, and two of your companions, your two companions A and B, are injured and able to move. You might carry one to base, uh, with which you've lost contact, and you save this person for sure, abandoning B to certain death. Or you might reverse the roles, or you might return to base on your own much faster and send rescuers with a 50% probability of saving both A and B. So what is the thing that you distribute in this kind of, so what is the distribution? It's the probability of survival. That's the thing that this example uh, highlights. And actually, in medical settings, this is extremely common. So in an hospital with limited blood supply, the allocation of blood determines precisely the chances of survival of each patient. So chances are interpreted as probabilities are the thing that is often distributed in these situations. You have two twins in a difficult delivery, and typically which one of the two saved depends on the particular uh, procedure followed. Not to mention the surgical separation of Siamese twins, but the budget allocation by a government uh, health ministry also essentially determines the chances of successful recovery for the different categories of patients. So in all these cases, the thing that is being distributed is essentially the chance of survival or the chance of su successful recovery. How about non-medical settings? Sport competitions, often handicaps, are chosen to affect the player's chances of winning. The structure of state subsidies determines the firm's chances of economic survival. Chances, chances, chances. Budget allocation to research teams determine their chances of making a discovery. And at even more general level, social policy affects individuals' opportunities, and opportunities in turn are often thought very simply, rather than with this complicated uh, intellectual structure of circumstances and effort, straight in terms of chances of life. For example, in the Human Poverty Index, uh, one of the key components is the probability of birth of not surviving to age 40. And actually, this is exactly how policymakers look at chances. So, and I should say, I'm not sure he actually believed in this, but he certainly said it. So Tony Blair said, if we are in politics for one thing, it is to make sure that all children are given the best chance in life. Probably more um, um, uh, kind of, uh, okay, anyway. In a major independent report on poverty and life chances uh, released just a couple of years ago, the Labour MP Frank Field in the UK said that improving the life chances of under fives is the key to cutting social inequality. And actually, the deputy leader, a Lib Dem um, leader, Nick Clegg, expresses in this way his worry about the perceived failure of the school system. Clegg's aides drew attention on Monday to the fact that just over 7% of children in England go to private schools, but go on to make 75% of judges and 70% of finance directors. In fact, actually, when you think about chances, the way social policymakers or pr practitioners look at this is precisely by just, by, uh, by just looking at the frequencies of people, right? So chances in terms of straight um, observed frequencies. So percentage of people from a certain background, ethnic or socioeconomic background, that go on to, um, let's say, top jobs or top universities and things like that. And this is exactly how people measure chances. So we thought, why not take this approach seriously and exactly model opportunities uh, as follows. Just think of an individual as a binary experiment. You can either succeed or fail. And then uh, opportunities in societies are expressed by the profile of chances of success across individuals, the probability that you actually succeed. This is an extreme simplification. Again, if you think about the equality of opportunity, liter opportunity literature, you would have to look at you know, people's backgrounds, um, things that they control, things they don't control, and so on and so forth. But I think, well, we think that this simplification has a number of advantages. One, again, is we're speaking the language of actual policymakers, but also, as you will see, this great simplification will provide some interesting answers to 
the first two questions, the what and the why. So, uh, and also some uh, new insights on possibly, possible alternatives to the few criteria that are used in social choice to um, look at our location. So our analysis leads to a preference for some degree of equality, as you will see, but the good thing is it does not stem from the nature of the equalizandum. It's not because we're, we think that some things should be um, um, equalized rather than others, but instead we will be able to justify an interest for equality from outside the stock of egalitarian principles. So just to give you an idea, typically the leximin or the, the Rawlsian type criteria are derived by assuming um, axioms like uh, Hammond equity. That's the typical axiom used. And, uh, and, and these type of axioms have a clear egalitarian content. So if you buy Hammond equity, then you typically are led to things like the leximin or the, the maximin, which is not hugely surprising. The thing that we do here, as you will see, is to derive a preference for equality without appealing to any axiom that has a clear egalitarian content. And in particular, we provide some new characterizations of Nash type criteria, whereby by Nash, we um, mean the product social welfare function, and you will see it in a second. And along the way, this has a number of sort of um, additional interesting features, for example, in this particular context, the Nash criterion will have an interesting uh, interpretation in terms of evaluating the probability that everyone succeeds in society. And this, hopefully, is going to be all clearer as we move. So this is interesting because the Nash ordering, so if you have only two individuals, um, the, the Nash criterion says just evaluate. So if it is chances, it's just the sum, sorry, the product of the probabilities of these two people su succeeding. Now, if you look at the product, the strong egalitarian implication is that it is sufficient to have one agent who fails for sure, so p is equal to zero, and you get the lowest possible um, ranking in the social welfare ordering. So it has a very strong egalitarian implication. Uh, regardless of, and if you have another million people, provided just one of them fails for sure, you get the worst possible outcome. So it has a very strong egalitarian implication. This comes at a cost, however, of huge indifference classes. Why? Suppose you have another, you have 100 individuals. According to the Nash criterion, the fact that one of them fails for sure is completely indifferent to all of them failing for sure. Why? The product is zero in both cases. So what we try is to provide a refinement to the Nash criterion, which we call the two-step Nash, which you will see in a second, which allows essentially to break down these large indifference classes by looking at the number of people who fail, essentially. So finally, last bit of last contribution of this is uh, there's a large and growing literature on intergenerational equity. Why? Because when it comes to many generations, typically you move from a finite to an infinite context because in an intergenerational context, there is absolutely no reason to stop analyzing uh, at a finite number of generations. By, uh, almost by definition, if you want to be fair, you have to include everyone, including people who might live very, very, very far away uh, in time from now. So the problem is with, infinite, with an infinite number of agents, you, there are a lot of com complexities involved, and actually impossibility results immediately arise. It's very, very simple to get impossibilities in an infinite context, and there is no such thing as a, an established um, theory. It's a growing literature, so again, trying to send some ideas. This is something you may want to work on. Um, so in the infinite context, the Nash criterion is quite interesting, and our approach in terms of chances is also interesting because you can think of generations as, again, a zero-one uh, type, in a zero-one type context, as either failing or not failing. And in even an Aristotelian perspective, you can think of self-realization, i.e. developing capacities, as the fundamental objective of mankind. If this is so, then the probability of success of a generation can be interpreted as the probability that the generation develops 
its inherently human capacities. Or maybe the degree of self-realization of each generation, or the proportion of individuals in a given generation that actually uh, self-realize. Well, there are four strands of literature that are related to this. One is the equality of opportunity that is quite well known. I've mentioned the differences there already. Um, the Nash ordering, we are not inventing it, actually, it's a Nash ordering, um, but it's typically been analyzed only in the finite context and only in um, when you have strictly positive numbers here, because as soon as you go to zero, you have a number of technical problems. Um, then you will see there is an, a small and growing literature on liberal principles of non-interference, which is going to be one of the key contributions uh, of the paper, because we're going to use a liberal principle of non-interference in order to justify uh, an egalitarian uh, ordering. And finally, as I mentioned, this big and growing literature on the evaluation of infinite streams um, and intergenerational equity. So, framework. We're just going to look at chances. We're not going to look at the mechanisms generating them. Second, um, we're not going to specify the physical alternatives and the agent's preferences. So it's just the evaluation of streams of chances. Third, we're just going to look at orderings. So we're going to focus on um, social relations and comparisons between different streams. <coughs> A bit of notation. We're going to both analyze societies with a, no a finite number of agents or an infinite uh, set of agents. B is just the unit interval. Why? Well, we are analyzing chances, so it seems like the obvious choice. So alternatives are going to be described as points in the box BT, which is just um, the Cartesian product of the unit interval, where T can be finite or infinite. And we sort of pompously call this the box of life. I mean, OK. Um, we're going to denote 1A as an, a profile which lists the chances of success of agents, and AT is just the probability of success of generation T. You can, when you have this infinite stream of chances, you can actually cut it in two parts. You have the T head, where you have the first T generations, or the T tail. And when you have a number which is in bold, that's essentially a constant vector with equal numbers. So for example, zero bold is just a vector in which everyone fails. And the one bold is the vector in which everyone uh, succeeds for sure. This is just uh, the vector notation. It's fairly standard. I'm, and I'm going to explain it uh, along the way anyway. And then this B plus set is simply the interior of the box, the situation in which uh, nobody fails for sure. So the set of vectors in which nobody fails for sure is going to be uh, B plus. Forget about P for the moment. I'm going to um, mention it later on. And finally, a permutation is a permutation. I assume that you have a fairly good idea. It's basically, you're switching. Um, numbers around in a given vector. And a finite permutation in an infinite context is a situation in which you permute a finite number of people and the rest stay where they are. Any questions? You're more than welcome to ask and interrupt me at any point. Please, sir. But I assume you have to get the microphone first. I have one question concerning this uh, infinite uh, number of agents. Maybe it's a philosophical question if the world will go on forever, but my uh, intuition would be that even in intergenerational um, like contexts, it should be a very large number, but still finite. Isn't that? Yeah, that's reasonable. But if you stop at m generations, you're excluding m, minus m plus 1. Why are you doing that? Why doesn't your criterion apply to generation m plus 1? Therefore, you go on forever. Um, any other questions? Nope. OK, jumping to the axioms. So let's start with finite societies. There are two criteria which are considered to be fairly um, 
non-controversial. The first one is strong Pareto optimality. Essentially, if you have two profiles of chances and one of them gives strictly higher chances of success to one agent and um, no chances of success lower to anyone else, you go for the former. So A weakly dominates B implies A is strictly better than B in the social opportunity ordering. That explains the S over the um, preference sign. Second criteria, which is considered to be um, a fundamental ethical requirement, is anonymity. Uh, anonymity simply says that, so if you have two individuals, uh, and if you have a pen, I had one. This is as good as this. So this is the situation where Peter uh, has uh, success for sure and I fail. And this is the situation where Peter fa fails for sure and I have success. And the fact that our identities don't matter, that's anonymity essentially. And it's a basic requirement of fairness. Basically, the identities of people uh, don't matter. Now, what is the social opportunity ordering? Uh, the one I briefly mentioned earlier on, uh, according to the Nash criterion, and it's called the Nash criterion because it reminds um, of the, um, if you think about the Nash bargaining solution, uh, you have something like this. So a vector is Nash preferred to another one if and only if the product of the former is greater or equal to the uh, product of the latter. Now, the first two axioms I've given you don't lead very far. A number of criteria satisfy both strong Pareto and um, anonymity, so you have to find something else in order to determine your social ordering. And the criterion that I'm going to try and explain here is a non-interference principle. It's one of a family of non-interference principles which we've analyzed with uh, my co-author Marco Mariotti of uh, St. Andrews. And Think about success as overcoming a series of independent hurdles, right? So if you are uh, the dustman's daughter, then in, for the success in becoming a doctor, this combines hurdles that a doctor's son does not fa face, namely both the gender and the economic gap. So the addition of removal of hurdles, you can imagine as having a multiplicative effect on chances. If you think of independent events, that's uh, fairly obvious. So with this interpretation in mind, and it's just an interpretation, the next axiom imposes some minimal limits of the, on the interference of society on individuals' opportunities. What does the next axiom say? It's called probabilistic non-interference. So take two vectors, two allocations of chances, and let's suppose that A is strictly preferred to B, whatever the reason. We don't know. So whatever the reason why A is strictly preferred to B, now, suppose that one person in this society has their chances altered. So you have that person I has rho times its original chance in both cases. So you are comparing two alternatives. In both alternatives, for whatever reason, for example, your house has burned or you didn't take uh, sufficient care or something, or so it could be for you know something that you're responsible of, or something you're not responsible of, but your chances go down in both cases. In the fashion described here, note that rho could be greater or smaller than one, so you could have a situation in which your chances go up in both situations, or they go down. But the key thing is everyone else's chances remain unchanged. So it's just one person whose chances have changed. Now, what we say is, well, whatever the reason, suppose that person I prefers A to B. Well, then society should not flip over the preference. So society preferred A to B. One person is hit or benefited. Everyone else considers a and B in exact, sorry, A prime and A and B prime in exactly the same way in which they uh, considered A and B. Well, what we say is, if society changed preferences, it is as if society was punishing person I. Now, punishment in this type of context, it's a bit of a, 
uh, it's a bit complicated to capture because we're looking at chances. We're not looking at the mechanisms underlying. So we don't have much information beyond um, the probabilities themselves. But the basic idea is, in this particular context, switching strict preferences from a preference for A over B to a preference for B prime over A prime is essentially punishing agent A, who's the only person whose welfare is affected. Now, we've explored this in a number of similar axioms that have the basic conceptual structure, and you can actually relate it to the harm principle that John Stuart Mill um, uh, described in On Liberty a long time ago. Now, again, so in other words, society's choice should not become less favorable to somebody only because her position has worsened or indeed improved. Now, again, the cause of the reduction or increases, uh, increase in opportunities for person I is completely ignored. It could be for care carelessness or bad luck. But in any case, the thing that is key is nobody else is affected. Given the information provided, there is no reason to switch preferences. Um, note that the axiom doesn't say anything about oops, whether this number is zero or not. So in this particular case, you might be multiplying um, rho by a zero number, in which case actually chan the B prime is not strictly lower than BI. It's just the same. It was zero, it remains zero. Maybe it's reasonable, maybe not. And in fact, we're going to explore a different version of this axiom in which um, we assume that person I is actually strictly affected in a negative way. But the, key, the other key thing is that this conclusion makes the veto power of the individual whose opportunities have changed very limited. So this doesn't say that the consequent of the axiom doesn't say, note, that if A was strictly preferred to B, A prime should be strictly preferred to B prime. It only says that you shouldn't reverse the strict preference. So if you start with an incomplete relation, this is an extremely weak um, axiom. Yes. Which slide? Yeah, uh, you also have some literature about preference that say you uh, evaluate your utility compared to others. Yep. So here it's not relevant uh, what happens to you if someone else is more successful? Uh, these are chances in life. Uh, this is just probabilities. You can think of them in an objective way. So this is the probability that this guy is successful in life. So there are no interaction effects. Or if you wish, they're already in there, right? But the key, even if, you know, whatever is in here, the key thing, suppose that person J is, for some reason, cares about person I, whose chances have changed. Still, what I'm saying here, I'm keeping these chances fixed. So whatever is underlying here, this thing is kept fixed. Answered? Yeah. Good. Oh, next question, yes. Uh, may I ask, <clears throat> uh, if uh, society is some sort of strategic interaction where by the engagement in society increases the size of the pie, could right. it be that if somebody is hit uh, negatively, um, he actually contributes, I mean, I, I want to ask, is it at all possible to have a situation where an individual is hit individually, and he, he or she does not decrease the chances of any of the other um, individuals? Suppose not. This makes the axiom even weaker, right? So this is a situation, you see, this axiom says, if this happens, then you shouldn't reach, then you should not change um, strict preferences. What you're telling me is, well, but there are many, you, it's very difficult to think of situations in which this type of configuration happens. If that is the case, the axiom is extremely weak because it hardly ever applies. Now, if you can reach any results with an axiom that is so weak, that's brilliant. So, in a sense, I can give you many reasons. So, this is inspired by John Stuart Mill, but it does not capture the, for example, it doesn't say when interference is legitimate, or it doesn't say that this is all the situations in which you should not interfere with individuals. We're just saying 
This is a minimal situation. Just a tiny, you know, let's, uh, let's agree, let's, let's disagree on everything else. Let's just agree that in this particular configuration, supposing it may happen, at least conceivably it can. Um, indeed, your objection is an objection that was moved to John Stuart Mill himself. Uh, the idea that there is no such thing as a situation in which my welfare is affected and absolutely nobody else. Nobody else is. is. Well, but that makes these type of axioms very weak, which is good. Right? And this is not a theory, this is not a general theory or a complete theory of um, liberal non-interference. It just captures a tiny bit on purpose. Answered? Good. Now, the thing that we found sort of surprising is, despite you know, how weak the stuff is, you go straight into an impossibility. So there exists no transitive social opportunity relation. So forget about completeness. You don't need completeness anywhere. And there is no social opportunity relation that satisfies anonymity, strong Pareto, and, and probabilistic non-interference, which was kind of puzzling to us because we thought it was, I mean, these were extremely weak. You can think of dozens of um, social welfare orderings that satisfy anonymity and strong Pareto. So we thought, well, maybe probabilistic and non-interference is too strong. Well, this is, I'm not going to give you many proofs, but this is quite cute because it's simple. So just consider two profiles, A and B. And uh, by anonymity and strong Pareto, what you do is you just permute, and you realize that A is strictly preferred to B. Why? Because you have the, all these bunch of people don't count. They'd all get one. And you have one here greater than a half, done. So by anonymity and strong Pareto, A is strictly preferred to B. Then you perturb, right? So what you do is you lower um, this guy's by a half, sorry, by a quarter. And you do the same for the first person in B, except he's already got zero. So he's going to remain at zero. And what you have now is by proportional non-interference, you would have that B prime is not strictly preferred to A prime. However, again, use anonymity, switch these guys, and you, then you can use strong Pareto, and you actually have to conclude that B prime is strictly, strongly preferred, sorry, strictly preferred to A prime, and that's a straight contradiction. So we said, oops, we are a bit stuck here, but then we realized that this impossibility result perhaps derives from the very special structure of the zeros in this exercise. So, well, this is just a bit of self-advertisement uh, showing why this result is so amazing. Um, so you have it even for relations that are uh, incomplete. And actually, you can even get rid of transitivity if, uh, instead of anonymity and Pareto optimality, you use the so-called supersend gradient principle, which is a mixture of anonymity and strong Pareto. Uh, that in, it says that if you have a profile of chances A, which is strictly, uh, well, weakly, uh, greater than a permutation of the vector of uh, chances B, then A is strictly preferred to B. This is a combination of anonymity and strong Pareto together. And in this case, then you have as a corollary of the previous result that there is no social opportunity relation, forget transitivity, forget completeness, etc., that satisfies just two axioms, supersend and probabilistic non-interference. Other people have found similar, well, conceptually similar impossibility results, uh, but again, I'm not sure you, uh, this is particularly telling, so let me skip this. When you have an impossibility result and you want to get out of it, you have to weaken your axioms somewhere. Before I do that, let me present a slightly different um, axiom coming from a completely different tradition. This is straight from the utilitarian um, literature. Uh, sure thing is a well-known principle uh, in utilitarian, um, for utilitarian orderings. And it says the following. I mean, suppose that you have a vector. Suppose that you have A weakly preferred to B and A prime weakly preferred to B prime. Then, if you mix them, you should preserve the preference. I mean, think of it as 
a sort of a compound lottery. Imagine uh, lambda uh, as a half, you toss a coin. What this axiom says is, well, toss a coin. If head comes, you compare A and B. If tail comes, then you compare A prime and B prime. Now, whatever the outcome of the toy costs, you are better off choosing this than this. And normally, this is what this axiom gives you um, the is one of the building blocks of the utilitarian um, ordering. Now, Diamond, this is fairly old stuff, Diamond criticized this saying, well, does it really make sense, this axiom? He says, well, look at these allocations of chances of success. A, A prime, and B prime are all 0, 1, right? This one. Peter gets 0, I get 1. And look at B. This is the opposite. Peter gets 1, I get 0. And take lambda uh, equal to a, uh, to a half. Then by anonymity, we know that all these vectors are indifferent. However, by this axiom sure thing, it is true that when you mix A and A, and a prime, since A and A prime are equal, the product of the mixture is just the same thing, 0, 1. And you mix B prime and B, you have to conclude that A double prime is just indifferent to B double prime. And Diamond said, well, actually, this doesn't seem to make sense, because here you have a situation in which the two of us succeed with 50% probability. And this is a situation in which one agent fails for sure, and the other one um, doesn't actually succeeds for sure. This doesn't seem ethically appealing in the least. So this is the diamond critique is not something I'm uh, mentioning as mine. What is the problem here? The problem here is that sure thing by mixing across individuals is sort of sweeping ethically relevant consequences under the carpet. The problem is that mixing opportunities across different individuals may produce ethically relevant effects. However, you can possibly avoid this and keep some of the appealing features of, um, um, of sure thing by just looking at one individual. Again, we have this kind of uh, liberal idea in mind of just focusing on in, uh, individuals. Now, individual sure thing is the next axiom we're gonna use. And the, the axiom is, almost identical to the previous one, except it says, well, do the following. Take A and B, such that A is strictly preferred to B, well, weakly preferred to B, and consider the two vectors that are identical to A and B, except possibly for one individual. Then, and suppose that A prime is weakly preferred to B prime, then the mixture should be weakly preferred. And you can see that the diamond critique doesn't apply. You cannot apply individual sure thing to the previous example, because that required mixing across individuals, which here it's not allowed. And in fact, diamond said, I can uh, subscribe to the previous principle for individual choice, but not for social choice. And in a sense, we're trying to capture precisely this. As I said, when you have an impossibility, you have to weaken your axioms. You don't weaken your axioms, you are stuck. So let's get rid of strong Pareto. Weak Pareto says that in order for A, well, if a vector of profile, well, a profile of chances of success is strictly greater than another, then A should be strictly socially preferred to B. Well, the surprising result, at least for us, is that, well, again, okay, I have only limited uh, uh, responsibility for the buzzwords. Uh, my co-author is not watching this, I didn't tell him. Um, a social opportunity ordering on the box of life um, satisfies anonymity, weak Pareto, probabilistic non-interference, and individual sure thing, if and only if it is the Nash ordering. So this is the the what question I mentioned earlier on is about what shall we distribute. We are suggesting that perhaps chances of success is a useful um, criterion. And it's useful because you actually are talking the language of policymakers. The why, well, the why is in a sense in here. We are providing a justification for a fairly egalitarian social welfare ordering 
by using no axiom that has a clear egalitarian content. So if you subscribe to two axioms, one of which comes from the utilitarian tradition, the other one from the liberal tradition, you go straight into a fairly strong egalitarian social welfare ordering. So in order to justify a fairly strong preference for equality, you don't need to use an egalitarian argument, something like Hammond equity. Hammond equity says, if you have two vectors, right, which are identical, except for two components, then you should choose the one where the two different components are closer. That's a clear, I mean, it has a clear egalitarian content. Choose the one where inequalities are smaller, essentially. Well, here, I didn't appeal to any axiom with an egalitarian content, and yet you get um, the Nash ordering. Please. Uh, you have to get the microphone. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if, if this is obvious, but are you thinking about the A sub i as a vector or as a scale? A sub i is a person. Right, it's a, it's a person. But yeah. when you, you do, for example, in the previous slide, you do a mixing yeah. of his opportunities, right? Yeah. For the individual person. Yeah. Then are you considering this A sub i that you're mixing um, like a vector of different opportunities in different fields of life? Or no, it it's would just be like a scalar? It's a scalar think? thing. It's a scalar thing. Right. So it's, uh, you can interpret it either as, so you can imagine this either as measuring the probability of success in a specific field of life, for example, probability of success in education, or you can think of it in terms of probability of success in life, a more general kind of measure, for example. Right. So, so then when you, when you do the mixing, you uh -huh. would get a, a clear strict preference between the, between the, if you are mixing scalars, you are going to find that simply the left hand side is greater than the right hand side, right? Uh, not in necessarily. The, in the mixing. No, right. for the individual in particular, because you said that everyone was... We don't know what A, I, and B, I are. We don't know them. They're not in here. You're not given anything. This simply says, if A is better than B, A prime is better than weekly, than B prime. Everyone has the same chances of success in A prime and A, and, A, and B prime and B separately. Right. Person I might have different right. uh, chances. Then you must have that the mixing must be the same. Now note that when you're mixing here, actually, for virtually everyone, the, 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 mixing, the mixing is going to change nothing because all the terms are equal. So right. you're not mixing anything. Except for one for, person. Ex except right. possibly for one person, yeah. But for, one, for that one person, for make A preferred to B uh, as a distribution, if everyone else is equal, for that one person, that one person should have that A strictly greater than B. Not necessarily. Sorry, a strictly or no, weakly better than B. Right. Not, not necessarily. Not necessarily? No, because uh, remember that it is people in A and people in A prime that are equal, and people in B and, and people in B prime equal, but separately. You're, these guys, so what happens to the person I, we don't know, and you don't need to know. Okay. Right? Okay. I'm sure I didn't convince you, but uh, perhaps you're in the break. I can think about it. Okay, thank you. Anyway, the, it is actually interesting. The, the interpretation of the Nash ordering is quite interesting in this context, in my view. Why? Now, if you think of each individual as a binary experiment with outcome either success or failure, if you think that these experiments are independent, and I know this is a fairly long shot, but still, then the Nash ordering, the product of the probabilities implies that you want to maximize the probability that everybody succeeds. You can think of society as a sort of a collective enterprise and the objective of society is to um, maximize the joint probability of success. Uh, as opposed to the utilitarian ordering, which we've also analyzed in this particular setting, which says that you should maximize the expected probability of success. And in fact, the utilitarian ordering, quite unsurprisingly, can have very unpleasant distributive implications because, uh, again, since you're maximizing the expected probability, you can have situations in which somebody gets a lot 
and somebody gets nothing, which is completely ruled out, or, well, to an extent, ruled out by the Nash ordering. Now, actually, in this framework, this is much more intuitive than in the standard utility framework. Why? What does it mean to maximize a product of utilities? This is the standard Nash criterion, right? In the standard Nash criterion, you're maximizing product of utilities. Now, in the utilitarian case, maximizing the sum of utilities, well, we know what it means. Or in the maximum case, maximizing the utility of the worst off makes sense, but maximizing the product of utilities, whereas maximizing the product of chances, as I've just uh, argued, has a fairly natural interpretation. Similarly, when you think about maximizing the Nash product on, in the utility space, you have to specify a welfare zero, right? That's the minimum in, in a sense. But in the bargaining context, you have the disagreement point as the natural uh, welfare zero. But in a general social choice context, this is not clear. Whereas here, in this uh, particular context, the zero is given uh, by the general framework. The problem, however, as I said, of the Nash uh, ordering is that a situation in which we both fail for sure is considered indifferent to a situation in which uh, I fail for sure and he doesn't. And that, perhaps, is not very uh, appealing. And it's a product of weakening uh, strong Pareto. We moved from strong Pareto to weak Pareto in order to avoid the impossibility. Now, what else can, can we try to refine our criteria to capture the differences between the situations in which everybody fails for sure and situations in which only one person fails for sure? Well, this is one possibility that we found, and that is this two-step two Nash social opportunity ordering. This is, may look a bit complicated, but the intuition is fairly simple. What you do is you prefer A to B. First, you count the number of people who fail, right? And if the number of people who fail is higher in B than in A, then go for A. Kind of makes sense. If instead the number of people who fail for sure, i.e. who have a probability of zero, is the same, then evaluate the product of uh, the probabilities on the positive elements. So um, these two would still be considered as indifferent. Because if you have that the number of people with positive probability of success is the same, and the product is the same, then you have indifference. So it's a way of breaking down this huge indifference classes that the, social, the Nash opportunity ordering gives you. Perhaps this is not appealing from an egalitarian viewpoint, because again, one may argue that uh, having this very strong aversion towards a situation in which somebody fails for sure is actually good. But if you don't believe that, this is a, a possible alternative. In order to get to this um, social ordering, we will have to change the axiomatic system a bit. And in particular, what we're going to do is, this is the same as before with two changes only. First, we're going to apply, we're going to restrict further the application of non-interference to situations in which, well, to components that are not equal to zero. So we will only consider situations in which the welfare of individual i changes strictly, either up or down. And also we're going to make the um, uh, consequent a bit stronger by assuming that strict preference is mapped into strict preference. The supply, well, OK. So the surprising thing of all this is that with anonymity and strong Pareto and the previous principle, you get a complete characterization of the two-step two Nash ordering. So again, by simply using, what, two totally standard axioms, anonymity and strong Pareto, virtually everyone uses them, and a liberal principle of non-interference or something inspired by the work of John Stuart Mill, you get something which um, is fairly egalitarian, a bit less than Nash, but still has a fairly strong egalitarian component. 
in the interior of the box of life, uh, so for strictly positive uh, vectors, what you have is, again, a fairly strong aversion to um, inequality. Well, you can skip the example. The basic thing it says is you may note individual sure thing is not there, and it's not there because two-step Nash doesn't satisfy it. And in fact, you get an impossibility straight away if you try to put a sure thing in there. The last thing I want to very briefly mention, I'm not going to go through the details, uh, but just to close this uh, first hour and then we all get a break. Well, no, you can ask as many questions as you want, of course. But anyway, um, how does this translate to infinite societies? Now, one thing you have to keep in mind is in infinite societies, if you try to have anonymity and strong Pareto, two axioms which I mentioned are fairly, fairly obvious, you get a straight impossibility immediately. So there is no social welfare ordering that satisfies in the infinite context strong Pareto and anonymity, which is a very strong and surprising result. And in fact, people are searching actively for criteria to evaluate infinite streams of utilities or, in, as in this case, chances. Um, so you have to weaken your axiomatic system quite sig significantly. So first you weaken anonymity and say, well, take two infinite vectors and change only a finite number of people. You have, so you can imagine this as a situation in which you have one zero and then an infinite sequence of a half. And this should be indifferent to zero, one, and an infinite sequence of a half. These two axioms are weakenings of strong Pareto. Uh, this says if A is strictly great, well, is weakly greater than B, then A is weakly preferred to B. You don't have the strict preference as in strong Pareto. And this is a similar axiom uh, that also incorporates a Pareto type intuition. Probabilistic non-interference is the same, except it only applies to vectors with the same tail. Individual sure thing is the same, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. This is a pretty nasty animal. But anyway, the, what you need in, in this kind of, in the infinite context, is you need some axioms that allow you to move typically from the comparison between in infinite vectors to instead an infinite number of comparisons of, let's call them, finite vectors. These type of axioms allow you to move from one, from, um, allow you to capture a lot of the stuff that goes on in the finite context and to translate it into the infinite context. So just to give you an example, uh, the first bit says, suppose that um, you have two vectors of chances A and B. Now, if, you, if it is true that from some point onwards, the head of A plus a bunch of ones dominates the head of B plus a bunch of ones forever, then it must be the case that A is strictly be uh, better than B. So you keep comparing, in a sense, the tails of A, sorry, the heads of A and B plus a bunch of ones, and then the strict preference is, pre is preserved in the limit. And the same is true for the indifference. Now, the unfortunately, the problem with Nash, and this is a typical problem if, if you think of the utilitarian criterion, you have exactly the same issue. Um, the problem with classical utilitarianism in, uh, in an infinite context is that a large number of vectors just sum to infinity, right? Now, the problem with Nash is similar. A large number of vectors of products of numbers between zero and one, they all go to zero, right? A large number of these vectors. So you need to find criteria to evaluate these, uh, these vectors rather than put them all in a huge indifference class. And the way this is typically done, actually this is a criterion that is coming, I think, from macro, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, look at the strict preference, for example, that A is, stri is strictly preferred to B if from some point onward, the product of the heads uh, of A is strictly greater than the product of the uh, heads for B. So from some point onwards, A overtakes B. And what this theorem does is essentially to translate the finite result into the infinite context. So all the insights that were true in the finite context 
carry over to the infinite context. So you can use Nash in the way just specified also to discuss um, uh, intergenerational equity. Same stuff. You have strong Pareto, you have strict probabilistic non-interference. These are the same things, but applied to an infinite context. And you can characterize the catching up criterion, which is a similar one. It's this two-step Nash. Let me just give you the intuition for this, and this is, I promise, my last uh, comment for the hour. Essentially, what this says is the following. Suppose that at some point, A, the vector A, the head, dominates the head of B according to the, two, the finite two-step Nash. So at some point, T, the head of A, two-step dominates the head of B, and the tails are Pareto ranked. So there exists a generation at which you can stop such that the, if you look at the first T people, the first T people in A are better than the first T people in B, according to the two-step Nash, and everybody else in A, from T onwards, is strictly better in A, well, weakly better in A than in B. So this is the catching up criteria applied to Nash. Well, with just three simple axioms, you can again extend the finite characterization of Nash, of the two-step Nash, onto the infinite context. Yeah, sorry, I don't understand now how this still satisfies the finite anonymity because you, uh, the one, the generation now is then more important than all the ones after it. Oh no, that that's not uh, that's not uh, really the case. It does satisfy finite anonymity because finite anonymity says if you have two vectors and you can permute the first t people and forget about the others, then what happens is the two vectors should be um, um, equivalent, right? This is what finite anonymity says. And this is perfectly uh, compatible with this, completely. Why? Because if you if take, suppose you are permuting the first T people. Now, if the first T people permuted, right, are exactly the same in A as in B, then you're going to have indifference here, right? According to the two-step two Nash, you're going to have indifference here. And since everybody else is the same, you're going to have equality here. So this thing is going to lead to an indifference. So it can satisfy it. It actually does. Again, I'm pretty sure I didn't convince you, but I, I promise. OK, if you don't trust me, trust my co-author. OK, conclusions, as promised. So. First thing is, what? Well, we think that chances is, uh, so opportunities as chances is a meaningful kind of variable to look at. This is what practitioners, policymakers actually look at. Uh, and we've shown that, this is the why bit, strong limits to inequality in the profile of opportunities are implied by liberal principles of justice. Actually, in, a, in another paper, we've used a slightly different uh, liberal principle, but inspired by exactly the same logic, and we've characterized lexamin, which, is, which was, again, a fairly surprising result, at least to us. Um, and these kind of, so the Nash criterion, for example, aside from the concavity of the evaluation functional, uh, says that even one person failing with certainty brings down the value of any profile to the minimum. And note that we're using a principle of social rationality, individual sure thing, um, to justify the use of the Nash social opportunity ordering, which acquires a natural interpretation here. Um, it is not purely egalitarian, fair enough. However, it is likely in practice to um, avoid major inequalities in chances. And this conclusion looks stronger if you consider that it is obtained without any reference to issues like talent or responsibility, which are at the forefront of the equality of opportunity literature, and indeed raise some doubts about 
the actual egalitarian implications of the standard equality of opportunity approach. So our conclusion is par partial to an extent, but it's unconditional. You don't need to know anything about talent or responsibility. Where to go next? Well, much of this was, of course, the former results remain there, whatever the interpretation. However, the interpretation that we've given treats individuals as independent experiments. As I said, this is the interpretation, not the results themselves. And at least to some extent, you can fiddle with the interpretation and define chances in such a way that indeed independence makes sense as an assumption, right? So for example, you might define success independently over states of nature or as, as averages across states. Yet there is, in a sense, it is actually interesting in principle to look at situations in which people's probabilities of success are actually correlated. Um, so in which case, you would have to find an ordering not over individual probabilities, but over the whole distributions of probabilities. You would have to, con to consider uh, individuals. This is relevant, for example, when the correlation device is under the control of the social decision maker. For example, whether you want to send two officials on a wartime mission traveling on the same plane on separate planes, because then obviously there is a correlation issue going on. So that's possibly something worth doing next. I thought concluding on this note, the first hour for a PhD bunch of students might be good. Questions or coffee? I go for coffee. Position, relative position. Why, why did you choose to go on with a utilitarian point of view and, and, and maximize it, the sum of the probabilities? Uh, maximize the product. Oh, oh, the product, yeah, yeah, of course. Which no, of course, it, of course it is correlated. It is, it is, of course, a step forward, but, but it doesn't give differentiated weights to the to different uh, people <laughs> depending on their relative position. Well, there's two answers to this. The first one is, if you think about two individuals, right? Think about two individuals, P1, P2, and you are on the 0, 1, so this is the box, right? According to Nash, the social indifference curve when somebody has 0 is this, right? These are all indifferent because somebody gets zero, hence the product is zero. Now this is exactly the kind of social indifference curve that you get with a maximum, which is the Rawlsian approach. So there is a bit of that in here already. Yeah, 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 but that's the whole point. We want chances. Now, so that's the first bit of the answer. Um, now note that these social indifference curves over points that are not on the boundary are all like this, because this is Nash. So there is a strong, you know, the concavity of these things, well, the convexity of these things, uh, implies precisely a, a preference towards um, uh, equality. And you can think of roles as a sort of a limiting case in which these things move to become uh, L-shaped. First part of the answer. Second part of the answer is, if you change the non-interference principle a bit, not much, you go straight to roles. We've done that. You can't write the same paper twice. So uh, we did this one. But it's still, I think that the surprising bit, at least it was surprising for me, is that you get something strongly egalitarian by starting, so this is the why question. You know, that every egalitarian approach will always raise uh, eyebrows from people who say, well, you know, if you go for equality, you have to sacrifice uh, something, right? So for example, the maximum says that you should be willing to give up the, uh, uh, no matter how big the amount of utility or chances of somebody who's better off in order to improve the welfare of the worst off no matter how little, right? This is the road. So this is the typical uh, criticism levied to any 
egalitarian social welfare ordering. Now, the surprising thing about this is that even if you adopt a perspective which has no obvious egalitarian implication, that's where you go to. So you justify a preference from equality from a principle that is completely outside the stock of egalitarian principles. Please. Uh -huh. And B would be um, one half money. Yep. Now, I think in that situation, I mean, one shouldn't rule out the case where it's like social ordering might sort of raise the first to B. I'm not saying it has to be that way, but if not, it prioritizes B. Then look at your, 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 your chain. So you're saying which one is strictly preferred? I would You mean B prime if you want to switch? Uh, what? If you want to switch, oh, yes, yeah. right? Is that what I want to do? Maybe I want to do the opposite. Uh, but the, the, the point is, <laughs> yes, yes, that, that is what I want to do. Right. But the reason why, I, I agree, this is a problem. So when it comes to numbers, the point is you start thinking in terms that are not necessarily liberal. So you look at, so what I'm trying to say is what you do is you look at these numbers and say, well, but then probably, for example, the sum, you can figure out examples in which, you know, the sum is such that, you know, it would make sense to switch. For example, this principle does not satisfy, sorry, utilitarianism doesn't satisfy this principle. So if you're a utilitarian, you will hate it, right? Because typically it will uh, tell you that you should not choose in many situations bundles that give a higher sum of chances. But we're not trying to find a utilitarian justification in the first place. So, or maybe, maybe you want to say, well, actually, no, uh, you should choose here, one half, one half, because you're a Rawlsian and you think, you know, here, the, but again, this is not the justification of this principle. The, the justification is if you're just perturbing the utility of, the, well, in, or the chances of one person, everything, everybody is the same, whatever the intuitions underlying this, if you don't keep these intuitions sort of out, then of course, this is going to muddle the justification of the axiom inevitably. So, I mean, I can give you utilitarian examples which will seem to make no sense. Um, so the axiom is like, oh, well, why would we choose this vector that gives a much smaller sum of utilities? Well, because this is not justified by using a utilitarian criterion. The, in order to criticize it, the question would be, would it make sense to punish one individual when everybody is exactly the same by switching social preferences? Why? Based on a utilitarian argument, yes. But then that's not a liberal argument. That's exactly the point. 
Yes. Um, I'm not very familiar with this literature, so uh, it might be a very naive question. Um, so when you do the Nash ordering, you give, when, and you consider the product of probabilities, you, do, you give a lot of ways to the, to the zeros. They have tremendous yeah. importance. So you, you switch to the two-step. But still in the two-step, you give a lot of weights to the zero, because the first step is the number of zeros in your. Yeah. So I was wondering if there are like other are the um, ordering you were looking at, are the ordering that would give less weight to the zeros in your vector, if you were looking at these kind of things, or if people were looking at these kind of things? With, um, in the context of the opportunities as chances, we've actually uh, provided the characterization of utilitarian type orderings as well. So you can fiddle with the axioms and you get, obviously, different results. But um, the fact that you give a lot of weights a weight to the zeros is part of the egalitarian appeal of these things. So imagine this literally as knowing for sure that as soon as you're born, the probability that you'll survive at age five is zero. The idea of giving a lot of weight to this well, make, sort, of, sort of makes sense, right? My egalitarian bias, yes. I mean, this is the summer school on, well, the mini school on inequality rather than <laughs> utility. But the, the framework is extremely, so put it this way, if you think that the, so there are a number of things you can take home, many. Uh, one of them is I'm pretty bad at doing slides. Another one, with slightly more interesting, is um, you know, the Nash criterion as a possible alternative. But another one, if you don't like Nash, still all this exercise might make sense in terms of, well, you know, the space of alternatives 0, 1, and interpreting chances of success as, well, interpreting opportunities as chances of success might make sense. However, instead of Nash, I'd rather go for the utilitarian criterion. Well, that you can still do it. So this would still tell you something. Something. Without going back to Italian, if there would be like another ordering that would be... Or oh, other refinements of Nash, yeah. maybe? Oh, yes, you can. Uh, I guess so. I mean, this is the one which we thought sort of felt natural. Also because note that the two-step Nash you get with anonymity, strong Pareto, almost uncontroversial, and one other axiom, no more than that, just another one, which is a liberal principle. So that's the thing that appealed to us. Uh, it's like, wow, we didn't expect this to happen. Just going back <laughs> to the medical examples at the beginning of your yep. uh, slides, I don't think this principle would fall very well there because they're usually maximizing the number of ones and sacrificing some zeros. Yeah, triage in wartime is another example where, you know, Essentially, people who are very likely to die are just left to die. Yeah. But again, this, this implies that uh, you, are, you don't think that um, an egalitarian way of allocating uh, chances is reasonable in some context, which is fine. Um, then, but the interesting, you know, the good thing about doing axiomatic analysis, I mean, people very often hate it. The reason I like it is it makes your intuitions very clear. So suppose you don't like the outcome, then telling you exactly what drives it gives you an indication of what you should drop. Presumably, you agree with strong Pareto. Presumably, you agree with anonymity. I mean, they sort of make sense. So you need to, to find some problems at the intellectual level, I mean, at the foundational level, with some of the other axioms. Maybe individual sure thing doesn't make sense. Okay, um, well, if you didn't like the first lecture, the second one is going to be much worse, I promise. <laughs> I, and I'm known to keep my promises. If you liked it, you will like this less. It's still, it's an ordinal. Um. Okay, so this is joint work uh, with um, 
my Japanese co-author uh, Naoki Yoshiara of um, Hitotsubashi University. Now, um, again, if you think of the three questions I wrote down, uh, one of them was um, what? And uh, this paper uh, is part of a sort of a uh, almost mass production of papers on this theme, uh, exploitation. Um, one thing that is nice to tell PhD students is to try and ask difficult questions um, and stuff that most people will think it's either dead or irrelevant. Um, and sometimes you get sort of surprising results. So why think about exploitation? Well, because a, a lot, you know, economists think it's sort of a totally dead stuff. Yet, everyone else doesn't, <laughs> which is always kind of puzzling. So it's absolutely prominent. So you analyze, for example, the ILO reports every year uh, contain discussions of exploitation of various bits of the labor force. ILO 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9. I mean, look at the past few years, and you've got uh, exploitation mentioned everywhere. There are controversies on drug testing and on the price of life-saving drugs, especially in developing countries, that are all centered on the issue of explo uh, exploitation. Actually, there was a, a big scandal by Pfizer testing a drug in Nigeria in '96, which has led to one of the most uh, expensive um, lawsuits. And Pfizer has been, uh, I think last year, condemned. Um, and the argument of the Federal Ministry of Health of Nigeria was that compensations to the participants were minimal or non-existent, as such a clear case of exploitation of the ignorant was established. Basically, the drug was tested on people who had no clue and were not compensated for it. Um, ethical issues arising in surrogate motherhood are all in terms of exploitation. Of course, the concept of exploitation is uh, very often used in Marxist social theory. And quite surprisingly, and now again, whether you believe that they believed it in it or not, but still, in 2007, in the very first paragraph of the program of the most important and one of the most historical left-wing parties in Europe, the German Social Democratic Party, they advocated a society free from poverty uh, uh, what's that, Ausbeutung, uh, and fear. And it's extensively discussed in normative theory and political philosophy. I mean, I've just given you a few, but uh, there are many more. And I can tell you that in the last conference of the American Economic Association, there was a full session devoted to the 30th anniversary of John Romer's uh, theory of exploitation and class. Um, that was quite interesting. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it because I was in it, but anyway. Um, and interesting, by the way, note that all these guys here are liberal uh, political philosophers. So it's not like um, kind of Indian reservation of the last few Marxists around. They're all um, uh, mainstream political philosophers. So the, the surprising thing from our perspective is that there's virtually no agreement about what exploitation entails. So it's used over and over again, yet people don't agree on even the most basic features of it. So the definition and its normative content are highly controversial. In the most general sense, A exploits B if and only if A takes unfair advantage of B, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy definition. Issue with it is, what does it mean to take advantage and what does it mean to have unfairness? My, our reading of this is that, however, whatever, so you need to specify two things. One is the taking advantage, which in our view involves some sort of power dimension, and the other thing is the unfairness. So if you want to have a general theory of exploitation, you would need to have a, um, a specification of both things, power on the one hand and distribution on the other hand, or unfairness. Um, this might seem obvious to you, but for example, in the whole discussion after the publication of John Romer's General Theory of Exploitation and Class, the idea was that only distribution mattered. Now, this is relevant for the what question I mentioned at the beginning. Why? Because in mainstream social choice, first of all, you look at utility. Secondly, power plays a very small role. And in a sense, Having, you know, starting to think about 
stuff that is not prominent in mainstream theory might lead to uh, quite interesting insights. Now, I'm not going to mention power here because it's extremely difficult to put um, to, in a rigorous way. However, we're going to analyze um, the distributive aspect of exploitation. And if you look, so if you look at the theory of exploitation in the general uh, framework, typically the idea is that exploitative relations are characterized by some sort of difference between the amount that somebody in the amount of labor that people contribute to society in some relevant sense and the amount of labor that they receive in some relevant sense. Of course, devil is in detail. And again, even in just by looking at much more focused um, issues, uh, um, there is uh, no agreement. So why look at an equal exchange of labor? Why is labor important? Well, first of all, typically the notion of exploitation in all the contexts I've given you, or most of them, involves some sort of exchange of labor. Secondly, inequalities, so in the theory of, of exploitation as the unequal exchange of labor, the two things that are relevant are labor and income. And there is a sense in which um, labor and income are among the key determinants of well-being, freedom, or self-realization. So there is a possible link there between the tradition of Rawls, Sen, and others, and um, uh, a theory uh, of exploitation, at least in the um, modern sense. Now, the, a non-exploitative solution is typically linked to the so-called proportional solution. It's basically the idea that everyone should get back in proportion to what he or she has contributed, focusing especially on labor. Now, this simple idea goes back, uh, it's a very nice paper by Francois Manique of Louvain, goes back at least to Aristotle. And there are some nice, interesting experimental studies in which um, the idea of proportionality between contribution and what you get back uh, apparently are very widespread. So if you ask people around whether this kind of proportionality makes sense from an ethical perspective, a lot of people actually agree with it. And there is a nice literature um, uh, Romer and Sylvester, 93, Jet, uh, Moulin, Review of Economic Studies, 1990, and a paper by John Romer, which I circulated, in which the proportional solution is analyzed, for example, in economies with um, externalities. And, all, and another reason, I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to convince you that, and, and the focus of the paper is not in trying to tell you that exploitation um, uh, is normatively relevant, uh, but I'm trying to highlight a number of reasons why inequalities in the distribution of labor might be relevant. Another one is this result, fairly famous from Roma's books, in which he proves that in general private ownership economies, uh, due to an unequal distribution of productive assets and wealth, you can prove that every employer or capital lender is an exploiter and every employee or capital borrower is exploited. And therefore, if you think about equal opportunities, then you have a, a and um, what you can see here is the link between wealth, initial wealth, and your uh, opportunities in life afterwards. So there is an, a one-to-one uh, -one or close to one-to-one -one link between uh, opportunities in life and your exploitation status. So um, again, yet another reason to think about it. Forget about this. Um, now, there have been a lot of uh, definitions of exploitation. You will see a few. Um, uh, I don't have that much time, so I, I'm going to try and just cover the essential. I, I'm just going to give you, I think, two results. Um, but one of them is the key one. Um, so there was a, a debate both on JET and on uh, Econometrica about uh, the appropriate definition of uh, exploitation. All this bunch of people have proposed different definitions. The key thing is all these definitions have different normative and positive uh, implications. So they are very technical, yet they end up having very different implications. For example, the correlation, well, the relation between class, inequality, and exploitation is preserved under some definitions, but not others. So if you think that is an important insight, then again, some definitions are better than others. So what do we do? Well, we asked 
we ask a simple question, and that, and that is, what kind of definitions of labor exploitation are appropriate? And you will not be surprised to know that we take an axiomatic approach. Why? Because if you look at the way people have done it so far is, you know, you propose a definition, somebody comes out and says, well, actually, your definition is um, implausible, has bad implications in this particular case, and then comes out with an alternative. And then somebody finds a counterexample, and then another definition is proposed and go on, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and it's a sort of a painful adjustment process. Um, so our idea is, well, start from uh, scratch and just say, my definition of exploitation should have some desirable properties. And then let's start from first principles rather than kind of groping towards uh, the best um, um, definition. So, substantively, we provide and then characterize axiomatically a novel definition which extends the core insights of exploitation theory and allows one to characterize the exploitation status of all agents. And this is related to a definition proposed by Duncan Foley uh, and then Gerard Dumenil, uh, which is also dubbed the new interpretation. The basic idea is that someone is exploited if and only if the labor she contributes is greater than the share of aggregate social labor that she receives via her income. And you will see in a second what it means. But again, it contains this kind of proportionality um, uh, ethical principle behind it. And it's the only one that satisfies four fairly weak axioms. Two, well, three are going to be pretty nasty to explain, and one instead is a fairly reasonable one. Okay, it takes a little bit of framework. Now, consider an economy. We analyze subsistence economies. Um, typically, people say, oh, why do you analyze subsistence economies? Well, uh, in an axiomatic characterization, we want to look at the simplest possible case. And then if our axioms can be generalized to other economies, then whatever you characterize on a subset of economies, you're also characterizing on the larger set. So you don't need, you need just the simplest possible framework. So production is fairly standard. Uh, there's a production set, uh, and these are activity vectors. Alpha naught is labor input. Alpha lower bar is productive uh, inputs of produced goods, and alpha upper bar is the uh, output produced. And we're going to assume that P is a closed convex cone. This goes back to general equilibrium theory, Mackenzie, et cetera. Um, and we're going to assume that in order to produce anything, you need labor, that you can produce anything as um, net output, and you have free disposal. These are all totally standard assumptions in general equilibrium theory. There are n agents. New is any of them. And what they do is they all have access to the same technology. Why, again, the logic is similar to the logic that Peter used yesterday. So we want to just focus on the key things and eliminate stuff that we think are relevant. Because if all the results are, are uh, um, sort of driven by huge types of heterogeneities and so on and so forth, then typically people go and say, OK, that was easy. Now, we're trying to push everything aside. So these guys have access to the same technology. Hence, exploitation cannot arise, for example, from monopoly power over certain types of technology. They are only characterized by different endowments. So omega nu is a vector of endowments of productive assets that these guys hold. Note that this model is very, very similar to John Romer's original model. Um, and people can do th three things. Gamma not new is labor supply. That's what it, the labor they sell on the market. Beta new is a productive activity that they activate hiring people. So they hire people and they choose beta new as uh, their activity vector, or they can work on their own capital as self-employed. So you can sell your labor, buy labor to produce, or work in your own shop. There is a price vector P, M goods, and a nominal wage rate W. Agents, what do they do? They minimize labor subject to purchasing a subsistence vector of commodities. Now, let me emphasize this again. We've analyzed, you, you're going to be given now an extremely simple subsistence economy uh, with homogeneous labor, labor and all the rest. We've analyzed 
economies with infinite horizon maximization, totally general utility functions, um, heterogeneous agents over all sorts of uh, dimensions, including um, uh, skills and so on and so forth. Most of the results just carry forward. This is just for the purposes of an axiomatic characterization. Keep it simple. Take a small set of economies. This is the, the, the minimization problem of the agents. So given a price vector, agents choose labor supply, um, the vector that they activate hiring people, and then the stuff that they do on the, in their own shop so as to maximize this is total labor expended, what you sell on the market, or the stuff that you use as self-employed. Subject two, this is a net revenue constraint. So B is your subsistence vector. This is the stuff you have to pay in order to subsist. If you want to think of it in terms of a minimum standards of living, this is perfectly OK. You, it's not like starving stuff. Um, and this is your net revenue. So this is the wage labor. Uh, sorry, this is labor earnings. This is the profit that you make by activating. So this is P times this thing is net revenue minus the wage you pay. And this is the net revenue that you make working in your own shop. You're not paying any wages except yourself. Um, and we're assuming he, down here that there is a total amount of labor that you can, uh, that sets a limit. Well, one is the limit to the amount of labor you can supply. You can't work more than a whole day. And finally, we, these people are both consumers and producers at the same time. So we scrap, we don't need to talk about firms. These people do the same, do both. The only thing is they can only activate um, production activities based on the amount of money they've got. Think of this as either a cash in advance constraint um, or um, a, an economy in which there are no credit markets. I mean, you can generalize and put financial markets in here. The key results don't change. Um, and this is not me saying it. It's John Romer. Again, I mean, if you don't believe me, believe him. So what is an economy in here? It's just a list of people, a production set, the subsistence vector, and the um, distribution of endowments in the economy. And the notion of equilibrium is fairly standard. So it's a situation in which everyone optimizes. Uh, the amount of inputs used does not exceed the endowment. There is equilibrium in the labor market. And essentially, uh, everyone gets their own um, subsistence vector. So this is total net output is sufficient for people to subsist. This was almost the worst part. Now, given this setting, the first thing we asked was, let's try to find out the minimum common denominator of each approach to exploitation. And that's the fall. So in any approach to exploitation as the unequal exchange of labor, exploitative relations, as I said, are characterized by differences between stuff that you contribute and stuff you get back. Now, the key thing is you want to identify, therefore, the normative benchmarks of the exchange, You know, the stuff that captures your normative intuitions about what is it that you contribute and what is it that you get back. In this particular economy, it's fairly simple. I mean, the stuff that you contribute is simply your total labor. This is what you give. What is it that you receive? Well, the agent receives an amount of labor that is contained in some very vague sense in some bundles that the agent receives. So you have two problems from an ethical perspective, from a normative perspective. You have to specify both what are these relevant reference bundles that are received. It could be what the agent actually consumes, but it could be actually any, for example, bundle on the budget line or any bundle on the budget set. There is no reason why one should focus on what people actually buy. But also, you want to identify what kind of labor these bundles carry with them. Now, just as a disclaimer, this has nothing to do whatsoever with the labor theory of value. Zero whatsoever. It's, this is an ethical exercise, and the question is how much labor is carried, in a very loose sense, by the bundles uh, that agents get in a normative sense. So the idea is to find an axiom which sets some weak restrictions on A, the choice of the normatively relevant uh, bundles, and B, on the labor that is associated with them. So 
take this set. This is the set of vectors that cost as much as the subsistence uh, bundle. Imagine this as the budget line of the agents, right? So B, imagine it as the budget line. In equilibrium, this is what it is, the budget line of the agents. So this is a key domain axiom, and it says, take any equilibrium of an economy. What does a definition of exploitation do? Well, it identifies two sets, the set of exploiters and the set of exploited agents, and these sets are different, okay? This is what any definition does. If it doesn't do this, it's not a definition of exploitation. So the key thing is, how do we, you identify these sets? Well, by choosing some reference bundles that are on the budget line so that people can actually afford, doesn't make sense to define exploitation with stuff that people can't buy, and there are, this thing here says, they are actually producible. So it's stuff that all, not only people can buy, but it can be produced. So it's not some magical bundle, it's something that can be produced. And the labor associated with these bundles is somehow the labor that is employed in the production of these bundles. Now note, this doesn't say anything about how you should choose the bundles, except that they are feasible, productively, and they can be bought, nothing else. And then, basically, the set of exploiters is a set of people who work less than the amount contained in one of these, and the set of exploited people is a set of people who work more than uh, the other cutoff. In principle, now note, this says it's two, but they don't need to be different. They could be the same, so it could be one. It doesn't matter. In most approaches, it's just one. So this is just a domain condition that captures all the core insights of uh, unequal exchange of labor exploitation, and it identifies the common structure characterizing all of the main approaches. So the labor that each agent receives depends on their income, and it is de determined in equilibrium by some ERBs, exploitation reference bundles that agents can purchase. This is extremely weak. It allows for more than one ERB, and it only requires that they are potentially affordable, not necessarily what people buy. Not only that, but it's related to production conditions, and they must be technologically feasible as their output. However, it's weak again because once you choose the bundles, you get the labor associated with them, but the way you choose them, it's up to you. There may be many ways of producing these bundles and therefore of determining the reference um, levels of labor. And the labor received by an agent need not be a single number. It could be an, an interval. So the, the axiom is on purpose as weak as possible in order to contain all possible approaches. Now, given the amount of time we've got, I'm going to skip most, most of this, but um, very quickly. So one of the most famous uh, old classic definitions of exploitation, it says, well, somebody is exploited if the amount of labor this person um, contributes to the economy is greater than the minimum amount of labor necessary to produce um, the subsistence bundle, technologically. Other definition by Romer says pretty much the same thing, except you only choose um, um, vectors that yield the maximum profit rate. Very quickly over this, let me just give you the definition that we think is more interesting. And by the way, all the previous definitions and all the definitions that you find in the literature satisfy the domain condition that we've given. So it is truly a domain condition. It sets, in a sense, the framework for every reasonable definition of exploitation. Now, this one is coming from Duncan Foley of the New School. And um, so the idea is take a given equilibrium and this is the total, uh, th it is the aggregate production point. So it tells you total output, total input, and total labor in the economy. Uh, take a number between zero and one such that essentially this number here tells you what? Well, um, you take total net output and you ask how much of total net output could an agent buy with his income? And this is exactly this number here. So it's scaling down whatever net output GDP you've got, you scale it down to the individual budget constraint. And then you say, well, take any equilibrium of the economy and the associated aggregate production activity 
somebody is exploited if and only if the amount of labor you contribute to the economy is greater than what? Well, this tau is the same tau as here, and this is total labor in the economy. So the share in the economy that you should receive in terms of labor is it corresponds to the share of income that you actually receive. Now, again, this satisfies LES. What is this theorem? Well, this theorem is a generalization of Roman's results because basically it tells you how you can identify somebody as exploited or exploited, whatever your definition is. So this theorem says, take any definition of exploitation that satisfies your, uh, this domain axiom, so all the definitions in the literature, basically the exploitation status entirely depends on this thing, which is wealth. So very rich agents, these are wealth cutoffs, very rich agents are exploited, uh, sorry, exploiters, and poor ones are exploited, and then there is a range of people who are in between. But this is not the key result I wanted to show you, and that's why I'm rushing a little bit here. The, the result I want to show you is, comes from the next three axioms, and that's it. Now, take a subset of economies with the same set of agents, same production set, same subsistence vector, and, and same aggregate endowments. So the only difference between the two economies is essentially how the same total endowments are distributed amongst agents. Then we say, well, consider a definition of exploitation that satisfies our domain axiom. What kind of property should this have? Well, take two economies that are identical except for the distribution of endowments. So they are identical in all respects except in one, some people have some wealth, other people have a different amount of wealth, but the total is the same. And suppose that they have identical equilibria, same equilibrium price vectors, but um, the optimal individual decisions are different between the two. And suppose, however, that although individual decisions are different, in aggregate, essentially these economies are identical. So note, these economies have the same fundamentals except for distribution of assets, same equilibria, at least in aggregate. Then our idea is, if these are the reference bundles that are in principle dependent on the equilibrium you are evaluating um, exploitation at, well, they should be the same. So in a sense, the way in which you identify the sets of agents, of course, the sets of agents that are exploiters and exploited might be different in the two economies, but the way in which you decide who is exploiter and who is exploited should not change just because the um, distribution of uh, wealth is different in two economies which are otherwise identical. So essentially, this is an independence axiom, which is very common in social choice. It says, if everything is the same except one thing which is sort of irrelevant, then your criteria should not change. Point is, all the definitions in the literature satisfy this. This is fairly unpleasant. But, so, okay, this is a continuity axiom. And it says, essentially, Suppose that you have an, equ an economy with an efficient equilibrium with zero profits and associated reference bundles. Suppose that you have an infinite sequence of economies that do what? Well, such that, note all these economies have same set of agents, same production, same subsistence vector, but different, uh, potentially different uh, endowments, but these endowments converge in the limit. And suppose that there is a, an infinite sequence of equilibria that actually converge to the equilibrium in here, then again, the reference bundles should converge. So very similar economies should have very, very similar um, uh, reference bundles and levels of um, reference levels of labor. Again, Every single definition in the literature satisfies this. So, so far I've given you three definitions, sorry, three axioms. One, 
that says, well, if you want to pick up who is an exploiter, who is exploited, you should choose some reference bundles that can be bought, can be produced, and they give you the benchmarks. How should these benchmarks be chosen? One is, well, they should be the same in economies that are identical, virtually identical, and they should be very, very similar in economies which are very, very similar. This is the intuition. I mean, this is a complicated mathematical structure, but the intuitions are extremely simple. So set exploitation based, so identify who's exploited and who is not by choosing reference bundles. And these reference bundles should be identical in economies which are uh, virtually identical and similar in economies which are very, very similar. So the question is, how do you pin down just one definition? And this is the nice bit, at least in my view. This is the fourth axiom and the last one, and this is the most intuitive of all four. This says, whatever your definition of exploitation, it should be such that whenever you have somebody who's exploiting, you must have somebody who's exploited. So you cannot have situations in which everyone exploits and there are no exploiters, uh, sorry, everyone exploits and nobody's exploited, right? And vice versa. Seems to me that this is the most intuitive of all four, right? All others are kind of complicated technically, etc. Now the weird thing, and to ask this was totally unsurprising, is that this is the key step. This, the easiest one to explain, I mean all the others I had to go through all the technical details, this is the obvious one. Well, in economies with at least three agents, the only definition that satisfies all four is the foley duminil definition. The one that says you are exploited if the amount of labor you put in is less than the share of social labor that you get back, where the share is determined by your share of income. So extremely simple, and the, in, the thing that was terribly surprising for us is that the result is entirely driven by what seems the most obvious and the weakest, theoretically speaking, of the axioms, which is this one. All other definitions satisfy one, two, and three, and this is the one that rules all others out. This implies that in all the other definitions, you have the possibility that there are economies in which everybody's exploited or everybody's an exploiter. And you can actually prove it. So once we got this result, then we started asking, I mean, we, we must have made something wrong. And then we played with different economies and it turns out that under the other definitions, you can actually have that. Right. What have we done? Well, revived a dead dog, hopefully. Um, so we have defined a system of four reasonably weak and arguably theoretically relevant axioms, which incorporate some key properties of the concept of exploitation. Now, in the paper, there's much more of it, uh, much more stuff. I've just given you the characterization because I think this is the one thing to bring home, if anything. Um, I mean, we derive the class exploitation correspondence principle, so we, we can prove that there is, in general, a very strong one-to-one um, -one relation between class status and exploitation status according to this definition. However, I'm trying to focus on what I think is the key result, which is the characterization. As far as I know, nobody has axiomatically characterized exploitation, and you might think, well, for a reason, um, in the sense that it's totally uninteresting. But uh, um, and again, we've shown that there is only one definition which satisfies these four axioms, and such that this class exploitation correspondence principle holds. But note again that this characterization holds in subsistence economies, but if you look at bigger economies and you expand the axioms, definition four still holds, and therefore, in, if you characterize it in a smaller subset of the economies and it satisfies the axioms in a bigger set, then your characterization can easily be extended. And you can analyze also accumulation economies, heterogeneous labor, general utility functions, and so on. The results carry over. But the thing I wanted to highlight to you is, in a sense, the road ahead, because the thing So this is, so in the definition we've characterized, essentially, 
what happens is this. You are exploited if P of um, So if this happens, you're exploited. Now, you can write this as this. Note, this is the amount of labor you expend. This is what you, um, the amount of income you've got, essentially, where it's consum consumption expenditure. This is total labor in the economy, and this is total, um, well, it's GDP in short. So if this ratio is greater than this ratio, then you are exploited. This is essentially the new uh, interpretation type thing. This suggests that an interesting index to look at in the economy is to look at these ratios. So look, if you want to have a look at how people fare from an exploitation perspective, look at the ratios of the amount of labor they spend over their income. This is a fairly rough measure of well-being, but it is arguably a key measure in the sense that higher, arguably, higher ratios imply lower welfare or lower well-being. So you can find a nice and interesting link between the profile of labors like, of, sorry, uh, ratios like this and the literature on inequality measures. So in principle, you can measure the degree of exploitation. So if you buy this stuff, you can measure the degree of exploitation in the economy by finding out, for example, the genie of these things. And interestingly, we have started to analyze this, these things with uh, some uh, co-authors who are more empirically minded. And apparently, these ratios here, are quite, the distribution of these ratios is quite interesting. And you have some fairly unintuitive results. For example, uh, if you take into account skills in here, and therefore you define labor contribution as effective labor contribution, you can find out very counterintuitively that some of the people who are exploited are people who are actually at the top of the income scale because you ha they have a huge uh, effective labor contribution. So, I mean, I'm, I don't want to oversell this, but I think, well, I do. So, uh, I think that there is a nice link there that takes uh, potentially um, exploitation to uh, the realm of other normative concepts, such as inequalities of functioning and capabilities, poverty indices, deprivation indices, etc. And I think that's a um, possible way forward. That's it. Thank you. Uh, well, your work reminds me of uh, Karl Popper's uh, demarcation criteria to identify what is science and what is not science. So my question is, uh, why do we want, on the first place, to uh, a particular definition to satisfy certain axioms? What is the usefulness of, of um, yeah, using this way of uh, determining what is uh, um, a good definition or not? So this is about the axiomatic method? I guess. Um, uh, when I presented this in a, a conference, there was somebody who, I'm not going to give any names, there was somebody who actually hated the conclusion because, you know, disagreed with Dumanil and Foley. So this person kept saying, oh, this is all wrong. Oh, this is, doesn't work, etc." And I said, okay, that's fine with me. Tell me which of the axioms you disagree with. Right? The good thing about the axiomatic method is it, get, it sets a framework whereby you can tell me, you know, it's not, I don't put, if you don't particularly like the conclusion, you can actually identify which of the premises 
are not really relevant. And it allows us, this is my personal perspective on this, to really discuss what the key basic principles that um, underlie our disagreement are. And I think this is hugely valuable. If you look at the whole, at the history of the, these debates, it was all like, oh, my definition is better than yours. Uh, mine deals with this counterexample, mine does that. But it was literally all kind of groping towards uh, trying to identify something that was robust. Going back to, you know, what do we want a definition of exploitation to do? That seems to me a more um, productive way of going forward. And the simple fact that the characterization result is driven by, I mean, put it this way. You know, I can take Morishima, well, it, I cannot anymore, but anyway, and John Roma with me up to this point. They would agree with all these axioms because their definitions satisfy them. And then I would say, look, do you disagree with this? If they don't, then they have to abandon their definitions. If they do, I think they're going to have a bit of a hard time because, I mean, isn't it sort of reasonable, this one? It seems to me it is. I mean, do we want a criterion that says everybody is exploited? I don't think it makes any sense. So, and the same is true for the previous paper. You know, it's like, okay, you don't like Nash? Fair enough. What is it that you find disputable in the axiomatic system? Uh, when it comes to ethical discussions, uh, putting down the foundations is, in my view, the most productive way of uh, settling disagreements. This one. Perhaps the second last slide. This one. Yeah. How, how do you measure effective contribution? Um, I mean, the, 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 an alternative way to go might be to try and look at labor input into, um, into human capital. Yep. Um, I'm worried about any, effect, any attempt to measure effective contribution could end up being a little bit circular. I'm sure you've thought about it. I'm interested. Well, no, I didn't think about it because that's the advantage of being a theorist. As I'm dumping this stuff on the applied people who are going to work with us. But, um, I mean, one way that is often used is to convert, um, to use relative wages. Uh, I mean, in, in a perfectly competitive world, what you have is the effective contribution, you know, you have marginal productivities and all that, and then you use sometimes wages to convert. That is a bit circular, but it's very difficult to actually observe um, people's contributions. I'm told you can in some ways, but as I said, I mean, I wouldn't even venture in this terrain. But the interesting thing is, you know, people have a hard time accepting the idea that exploitation is something not esoteric. Well, this is something that you might find it disputable, but it's entirely based on observables. There is nothing here that relies on obscure, complex stuff, the labor theory of value or anything. This is, everything in here is observable in principle. And I think this is a huge advantage. You don't, you just look at what people do and you have a clear criterion. So I, you know, but once I have the answer to your question, I'll, I promise I'll email. I, uh, I really appreciate this because I haven't seen uh, Foley's and uh, Duminil Levy's work in, in, this, in this context, so I found that really interesting. But I also found it a bit puzzling because I haven't quite figured out how, it, how you work their approach in, into your approach. Because, I mean, ultimately the, the new solution is a solution to the transformation problem, so it has everything to do with the labor theory of value. Um, of course, you can, well, you can kind of skip that part and say, well, there is the correspondence between prices and labor values, and I'm just going to focus on one and ignore the other, which is, which is fine. Um, so that's the one thing. And the other thing is that um, 
I think when you propose the definition, you propose it under the header unequal exchange exploitation. Yep. Um, and my reading of uh, this work on the transformation problem from uh, Foley and Gerard is that it's very much, and that's where the labor theory again comes in, it's very much a theory of equal exchange and it's labor power for the wage and not labor. So um, I, just, I just want to understand better how you use what seems to me labor theory of value, drop the labor theory of value and then turn it into a, a normative argument. It's, it's fine, I just want to understand how you do that. Uh, I think it's in Annie Hall that uh, Woody Allen is lining in a, in a cinema and then all of a sudden there's this discussion about Marshall McLuhan and he pulls Marshall McLuhan out of a, behind a poster and says, now explain this guy that this is actually your theory. And then Marshall McLuhan says, oh, yes, that's actually right. Well, I, can, I could do the same with Duncan because I went to discuss this, so I have the official approval. Um, having said this, okay, first of all, note, I'm talking about unequal exchange plus of labor. So this is the key thing. Um, and that sort of sidesteps all old arguments about um, whether prices are equal to labor values or anything. Secondly, um, this is general equilibrium um, approach where prices are determined in uh, a general equilibrium framework. Uh, the way in which the prices are determined, it's immaterial to the discussion. That's why I'm sidestepping that as well. And I'm not interested in that. Uh, I, my perspective, just like in the previous lecture, is purely normative. I'm, I'm trying to find ways in which we can analyze economies. So one is analyze, looking at chances. Another one is looking at objective things that we can measure. And our intuition is that labor and income, these ratios, are key to the well-being and self-realization of people, right? Uh, again, this is an attempt to move away from the welfaristic kind of obsession of mainstream uh, approaches to social choice and economics in general. So this is saying, well, look, this might be an interesting indicator and something which is measurable rather than subjective utility, for example. And it, could, it has a, a number of links, for example, with class status. You can prove that. Um, so I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm, I haven't convinced you, but I mean, a big difference between what Duncan and Gerard have done and what we're doing is they take an explicitly macro perspective, whereas here we're looking at individuals and we are interested precisely in that. So this is this should be more precisely called an extension of their work. Um, but again, our focus is primarily normative and theirs is not, admittedly. But, I mean, there is a clear link there. You're unconvinced, but we can discuss this. Um, to, to what extent your theory can deal with productivity increases. So, for example, when in my reference bundle previously I, uh, I receive a computer, but there's now a productivity increase, which means that the computer now is being produced only by two people instead of three. This means that I'm formally more exploited in that I receive less in terms of effective uh, labor contribution uh, when this is used as a numeraire? It's very difficult to do this kind of partial analysis because this is a general equilibrium perspective. So one would have to perturb the whole thing and see. You see, you cannot determine individual uh, exploitation status unless you know the whole equilibrium of the economy. So it's very difficult to uh, give an answer to your question. Uh, this is an inherently general equilibrium perspective. And unlike many of the definitions, unless you know, so one example of why you know, labor theory value type discussions are irrelevant here is that here you cannot define exploitation status unless you already know prices. So prices are the primitive. I know this might be depressing for many people who kind of believe in the labor theory value, but in this particular, but in this particular approach, unless you know prices and the whole equilibrium of the economy, you cannot do anything about you know, whether pay people are exploited or not. We think this is a virtue, actually, because um, you know, this is, a, so we really wanted something that was clearly observable, measurable, that you can actually tell, explain people 
why this might be relevant. And I think we can uh, agree on the fact that labor and income are two fundamental determinants of, um, of people's well-being. Now, back to your question, analyzing technical change would be a very interesting um, uh, way forward. So if you have any intuitions, email. Uh, just a one, uh, <coughs> it's not a question, but more of a comment. Is there a relationship between this theory and maybe the, the, the choice of functional formulation of, say, for example, a production function, where if in the sta standard com Douglas case, you have one minus alpha being the, uh, the share that uh, labor, for example, contributes? This is, this is a very general production structure. I mean, normally this stuff has been discussed in Leontief type economies. Now, here we have a convex cone, so it's constant returns to scale. So it's a very general. So the only thing that doesn't fall into here is increasing returns to scale. But this is a typical problem for general equilibrium theory. But apart from that, you know, it's, um, the original, the production set is extremely general. And again, you can put in, for example, different types of labor. We've done it, and the definition still works. It highlights a number of puzzling normative features. Once again, typically the fact that there are people who are so productive because they have special skills that they may end up as being exploited even if they're rich. Is this a problem? Actually, I think this is interesting. You know, have, finding counterintuitive stuff is the first step towards kind of moving forward. Yeah, of course. Self-exploitation. Well, in principle, yes. So I had a similar question um, on the other hand. If um, you are looking at exploitation in terms of your contribution and what you get back, um, can we make exceptions? Like maybe your contribution is, as you mean, we've defined prices and value of labor and everything. Your contribution is below subsistence or what we look at. I'm thinking in terms of welfare, if economies and how they might interpret this in policy-wise. If your contribution is below some subsistence level, does that justify exploitation, like you just said? The honest answer is I'm not sure. So um, to move this, so the next argument is actually to investigate the why an unequal distribution of these ratios is actually of normative concern. Now, this is just a first step. I mean, the first thing you have, we wanted to do is to show that you have a perfectly consistent theory that says something potentially relevant. Whether this is relevant, including in policy applications, that's really the next step forward. But first, I mean, ask any of your colleagues, PhDs, etc., and they will tell you, you know, exploitation is just something inconsistent that you cannot define in any meaningful way. It's based on flawed stuff, it doesn't work, and it makes no sense. Well, to me, this is preliminary evidence that there is a consistent, logically consistent, there is no kind of weird stuff going on, no internal contradictions, theory that has a prima facie, in my view, normative appeal. Now, this is really the first step. And the first thing we wanted to do is precisely to find out something that you could axiomatize, so whose foundations you could actually explain, and then had, was based entirely on observables, could be taken to the empirical data, you could find you know, potentially interesting stuff about you know, how these ratios are um, distributed, um, for example, across countries as well, or across different groups. more on the methodological side. So I, uh, it seems to me that you're very fond of the axiomatic uh, Looks approach. Looks like, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I, 
I have the feeling that there is also a certain level of subjectivity in the axiomatic method, although I think the uh, followers of the axiomatic methods believe that they are uh, very objective and there is no, uh, well, uh, subjective uh, parts of that. I, I would like to hear your comments uh, on the uh, difficulties, the issues that uh, this type of methodology has when you're dealing with constructing models and also when you try to apply your main findings to uh, real world issues, for instance. Again, what I mean, the subjectivity is all in the content of the axioms. I don't think it is necessarily in the methodology. And I'm not trying to tell you that any other discussion which is not based on axioms is irrelevant. I mean, that's not my claim. But if you look at many of the, I mean, the exploitation bit is probably even better as an example than the chances bit. I mean, if look at the literature, there have been, I mean, people have been at each other's throat for ages and ages, you know, this is what Marx said, this is what exploitation actually is, um, my definition is better than yours, uh, my definition solves this particular problem, yours doesn't, and things like that. We thought that an axiomatic method might lead to a more productive way of looking at these things uh, in the sense of, you know, putting things on the table and then discussing them. Of course, there's a huge deal of subjectivity, but that's, you know, why. So my point is, you don't like this? Propose your own axioms. Tell me what you think an a definition of exploitation should do. I think it should do this. But that's why I like it. I mean, that's, the subjectivity of it is in the content rather than in the method, uh, in my view. So, sorry. so is this constraint to, uh, for uh, modeling purposes? Like, if, if your definition um, actually follows the axioms that you're establishing, then you will be able to construct a particular model based on that. If not, then the, this well, the definition axioms is the axioms are defined within a model, so it's the other way around. So first comes the model, then come the axioms. Oh. So, uh, but, but again, I mean, there are things that cannot be easily modeled. I mean, power is an example, uh, and Peter's discussion yesterday is really the exception. So, and as I said, I'm not claiming that this works for everything. But for something, it, things it does, and I think this is a good example, actually. Thank you. Does this work? Yes. Great. Um, thank you so much. Got swept up in it um, as far as I could tag along. Um, getting back all the way to your original observation that, it, that it's a, um, the definition of exploitation should be one of unjust advantage, taking, advan taking unjust advantage. Now, with, as we have it here, as we have the, the ratio here, would the unjust bit be helped by introducing a social tolerance boundary where you accept some sort of redistribution that is still just or justified? Because as such, I, I sec as it's presented here, I have a little bit of trouble reading in the just bit of it. Um, but with social boundaries in it, perhaps it will work um, to satisfy the original you. definition. This is just, a, as I said, this is a first step to a large extent. So this, this whole discussion, in a sense, says the following. Look at, oops, look at these ratios. Now, which kind of, so, and, and then take it from there. One of the things that comes next is what kind of distribution of these ratios is worrisome or in unjust? Well, then that really is the next step. So, for example, I mean, if you go back to Roma's original work, 1982, the thing he found was that there was, you know, a link between the standard Marxian type exploitation and uh, unequal distribution of wealth. And then the next question was exactly, you know, is this unjust? Where does the injustice come from? And his answer was, it comes from uh, an unjust distribution of wealth to start with. So if the original distribution of wealth is unjust, then the resulting exploitation is unjust too. So in a sense, in all these theories of exploitation, the thing that we still kind of 
trying to figure out is where does the injustice come from? So here we have these ratios, inequalities in these ratios sort of seem already to be troubling, especially given the huge disparities involved, the boundaries you mentioned, but then there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm entirely with you. Not just pleasing the audience, I, I swear I'm honest. Shall we move next quickly to the third bit? Yeah, we can discuss later. Yeah. I can't do this, can I? Okay, last bit is the easiest one because I can actually take all criticisms is not my stuff. Uh, I don't remember, so view, full screen mode. This is the third question, is the how question. And although it's gonna seem sort of unrelated, you will see why it's relevant to um, the exploitation bit in a second. So as I said, there were three questions. What is the relevant variable to distribute, to look at? You've seen chances, and you've seen um, uh, labor income ratios. The why question was, why should we look at equality? And you've seen one possible answer in, you know, starting from even liberal principles, you can find a justification to look at inequalities. The third question is, how do we get there? How can we actually implement allocations? And this is one new piece of work by John Romer, which is quite relevant and has nice, possibly unexplored links, for example, with the exploitation literature. So um, now in economics, we are accustomed to what might be called an autarkic focus. Now autarkic is a bit different from selfish. Autarkic in the set only implies that when people decide, they normally just uh, to do stuff, they normally just ignore the effects on others. Uh, and this can be contrasted to interdependent behavior. I'm not talking about strategic interdependence in the sense of game theory, but just, uh, I mean, think of the usual prisoner's dilemma stories. What you do is you just ignore the effect you impose on others. This comes partly from a positive claim about humans as people who are autarkic. I mean, this is the sort of consensus amongst many economists. And this type of focus has as an, as, as an implication um, the focus on Nash equilibrium as the obvious uh, solution concept, you know, given that people don't care about others. If you think about the, the uh, kind of reasoning behind Nash equilibrium, this is precisely what people do. I mean, shall I do, shall I change my behavior keeping whatever, what everybody else is doing constant it's literally just a purely autarkic exercise. I just look at myself and take the others as given. And this leads typically, although not always, to a normative focus on self-regarding individuals, roughly. However, these kind of focus has severe limitations. I mean, first of all, if you think about, you know, focus on self-regarding individuals, well, actually, in a number of disciplines, and increasingly in economics, there is a growing attention to the claim that people are actually cooperative. So in evolutionary biology, this is not even discussed. It's just a premise, and people study how cooperation emerged, emerges from, um, uh, you know, in an evolutionary perspective. And in experimental economics, there are huge, there's a huge literature showing that actually people don't play Nash, but normally altruistically. I mean, think about ultimatum games and things like that. And you can see some nice surveys of work in experimental economics, anthropology, and evolutionary biologies about <coughs> humans as a cooperative species. But there is another aspect to the limits of an autarkic focus. Um, in the last book published by philosopher Jerry Cohen, he offered a definition of socialism as essentially a, a society in which earnings accord with equality of opportunity a la Rawls, Dawking, Anson, and Cohen, but in which inequality in earnings is further limited by a sort of a community uh, ethos in which people care about and, where necessary, care for one another and, two, care that they care about one another. But then he raises a question. I mean, suppose this happens. 
then the principal problem that faces the socialist ideal is that we don't know how to design the machinery that would make it run. So our problem is not primarily that people are selfish, but that we don't know how to organize uh, a society um, in which people care about. So our problem is a problem of design. This, where does this come from? Well, suppose you have a social ethos, right? This implies that you can't really use the welfare theorems. Why? Because why, on the one interpretation, when you have social ethos, then you have massive consumption externalities. And we know that a competitive allocation does not exist in this case. And therefore, we cannot really use markets as efficient mechanisms to um, decentralize um, and to organize. However, this is a problem. Why? Because in any complex economy, markets will have to uh, play an important role. So we're stuck with a big implementation problem. So how can a society with social ethos, while assuming people actually do care for others, achieve Pareto efficiency? Let me give yet another third problem with the autarkic focus uh, in economics. Think about the commons, right? The tragedy of the commons has in common with altruism precisely the existence of an externality. It's a different type of externality, but yet an externality. This is the basic story. We know this. Well, there's a lake uh, owned by fishers. Fishers have preferences over fish and leisure, perhaps differential skill for, for fishing. And then the lake produces fish with decreasing returns to scale. If people play Nash in the game in which each fisher sets their labor time for fishing, then typically you have an inefficient outcome due to congestion externalities, the tragedy of the commons. Well, surprise. So if you're an, econo an economist, you think that these guys are just going to uh, destroy their uh, common resource. But just if you're an economist, because the Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, Ostrom proved actually that in many, or most of the societies in this situ situation actually learn to regulate fishing without privatizing the lake. And uh, somehow, the inefficient Nash equilibrium is avoided. Now, the key thing to note is that this is not an example in which fishers necessarily care about each other. So you don't need to have altruism to understand why they avoid it, but it, rather one in which cooperation is organized to deal with the negative externality of autarkic behavior. So we have three different sources of limitations for um, the typical autarkic focus in economics. Let's try to make it formal, but not very formal. So take just a game in normal form with n players. Each player chooses an action, L. And from a common strategy space, imagine it, the real numbers, the positive real numbers. So you can set, for example, suppose Li is just labor or effort, just to keep the similarity with the commons example. So a vector of strategy is L bold. And um, L minus I is just the vector of everyone but Mr. I. The payoff of each player is VI, and the game is just given by the strategy space and the payoff functions of all players. This is a fairly standard game in normal form. Now, the interesting thing, the big, in my view, contribution um, that Rome has given um, here is to find a different solution concept, which has nothing to do with Nash, has no relation with Nash refinements which is the following. He says, what is a Kantian equilibrium? One in which people do not think autarkically, but they think uh, in interdependently, not altruistically, interdependently. It's this. It's a vector of strategies in the strategy space such of, of this game, such that for all agents, essentially, they maximize their own welfare by asking what... So I choose a strategy, shall I change my strategy? Well, only if I assume that everyone changes their strategies in exactly the same way. And so whenever I decide whether it is better for me to increase fishing, I ask, would I want everyone to do exactly the same thing I'm doing? So this is the Kantian element. So whenever people decide, they ask themselves, well, now I'm fishing three hours. Should I increase my fishing by 10%? Well, in Nash, what people do is 
They compare their payoff now, keep everyone else's choices fixed, and ask, shall I increase or not? In Kant, in the Kantian equilibrium a la Roma, the idea is, shall I increase my fishing by 10%, assuming that everyone else does the same? So would I want everyone to increase fishing by 10%? When you are at a point, so alpha is just a number that multiplies the whole vector of labors. So when you are at a point where you don't want, so the maximum of this is reached where alpha is equal to one, that means you are at an equilibrium. Your welfare is maximized and you don't want to change the whole vector of uh, labors in the same way. So the categorical imperative here says, one should take those actions and only those actions that one would advocate all others take as well. So one should expand one's labor by a factor alpha, even only if one would have all others expand theirs by the same factor. So note, this is the key thing. We're not saying that everyone should do the same. This is not it. So it's not levels you're comparing, you're comparing changes. So Kantian behavior here is defined with respect to comparison of the present with a class of counterfactual alternatives. And in particular here, we're looking at multiplicative changes. I'm gonna mention briefly some possible extensions later. You can change the counterfactual and get different. So for example, should people add more labor rather than multiply? Um, and the results are fairly surprising in all cases. So this yields a cooperative norm, and you can contrast it with an inherently non-cooperative concept um, of Nash equilibrium, where the counterfactual is that you change your own labor and everyone else does the same. So another way just to contrast this with the Nash equilibrium with, with which all of us are much more familiar, essentially you can rephrase the previous definition as follows, and I hope this should clarify things a bit. So something is a, so a vector of strategies is a profile of strategies is a Kantian equilibrium of a game if for every agent, and for all possible multiplicative changes, so increases by 10% or decreasing by 10%, what you're actually doing now is better weekly than what you would get if everyone changed in the same proportional fashion. So the key thing is, Kantian behavior here does not ask an individual to be empathetic. You don't need to ask, what would I do if I were that guy? Would I want that person to do something? You're not doing this. You're taking your own perspective. Note that this is your own payoff. It's not somebody else's payoff. So basically, this kind of behavior enjoins the individual to behave in the way that would maximize her welfare if all others behave in the same fashion. So in a sense, it, is, it requires less of an unselfish behavior than typical altruistic um, um, criteria. So let me just give a couple of definitions. Um, so a game is monotone increasing or decreasing if the payoff of every agent is strictly increasing or decreasing in the strategies of the others. So think about the fishery. The game is monotone increase, sorry, decreasing because my welfare is negatively affected if everybody else in increases their fishing. Um, and a strategy profile is G efficient if there exists no other strategy profile that Pareto dominates it in the game. So it's specific to the game. Um, now, the interesting thing is, and this is a hugely surprising result, at least to me, that if you take a game that is monotone increasing or decreasing, then any Kantian equilibrium of the game is actually efficient. So if people think as Kantian optimizers rather than Nash optimizers, then the game is efficient. So even potentially in games in which you have externalities, which is a huge difference with what typically happens in the Nash context. Not only that, but you can actually prove that if this condition holds, and this is a, just a technical condition that guarantees uh, you know, compact space, and therefore you can use Burge's maximum theorem, basically that they're always, well, these are the conditions for the existence of a Kantian equilibrium for any game. Satisfying this fairly mild um, condition. So under general conditions, the Kantian equilibrium exists and is efficient. 
let me just give you a couple of examples uh, that I find particularly striking. I mean, take the standard prisoner's dilemma. Two people, pure strategies available to them are just corporate defect. And if you're allowed to randomize, basically what people can do is the probability of defecting or cooperating. So P uh, means that player cooperates with probability P. This is the typical prisoner's dilemma game. If they both cooperate, they're out of prison, get uh, uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern utility of one each. If they both defect, they're convicted and they get zero. If one defects and the other one cooperates, the defector gets A, which is greater than one, the payoff of cooperating. But the cooperating guy, uh, you know, the sucker, call it, uh, gets negative payoff, and vice versa if rows are inverted. This is the typical prisoner's dilemma game. For any strategy pair where P is the probability with which player one, this guy, cooperates, and Q is the probability with which player two cooperates, then the, play the payoffs are these. And this is standard. I mean, this is just the usual payoffs. So PQ would be, is the probability with which they both cooperate, and therefore this agent gets one. Um, and then if he cooperates and she doesn't, he gets to this thing with probability P times 1 minus Q, and therefore gets D, and so on and so forth. Now, what is the Kantian equilibrium in this game? Well, suppose we want to check whether cooperation can emerge as a, an equilibrium, i.e. they both decide to cooperate with probability 1. So 1-1 one, one implies they both cooperate for sure. When is this a Kantian equilibrium? Where, when the payoff, so remember this is as if it was implicitly multiplied by one. So you're asking, well, is it, so shall I increase the probability with which I am, or decrease the probability with which I am cooperating? Well, assuming the other guy does exactly the same as I do, then my payoff would be VJ alpha alpha. Alpha is the, the perturbation to what people do. Well, if, if the maximum is reached with alpha equals one, it means that cooperating for sure is actually the best, the best option if you adopt Kantian reasoning. Alternatively, you just find the alpha that maximizes this. This is just the, pay, the previous payoff at one one, where both cooperate. Just do it, first order condition, straight, fairly simple. Interesting stuff is one one is a Kantian equilibrium of the prisoner's dilemma game if and only if this condition and payoffs holds. And in this case, there is no other Kantian equilibrium. So whereas in, uh, it is a dominant strategy to actually defect, so if people adopt autarkic behavior, these guys don't um, never reach the cooperative equilibrium, in this case, they can. Now, if this condition holds instead, then the unique non-trivial Kantian equilibrium is given by both of them cooperating with this probability, which is still greater than a half. So if they adopt Kantian equilibrium in the worst case scenario, they cooperate half of the times. Whereas remember, the dominant strategy of the game is to never cooperate. And this is without repetition. So you're not invoking repeated games. You're not uh, invoking external payoffs of any sort. So the way I see it, this is a fairly surprising result. Um, so Kantian reasoning promotes full cooperation, so this, uh, so A up here, provided the average of the utility of cheating, A, uh, playing D when the, co the opponent plays C, and the utility of being a sucker, so D, playing corporate when the opponent defects, is not too high. However, even when full cooperation is not achieved, players pay co play cooperatively, with a probability of at least one half. However, you can actually reconsider the tragedy of the commons. Um, and this is going to take um, five minutes. You want me to go through it? So meaning yes a little more? OK. OK. Um, there's just a bit of notation um, to keep in mind. So take any economy where you have, these are the utilities of the fishers. 
put it this way, over leisure, sorry, over labor and fish is caught. Um, S is their skills in catching fish, and F is the production function in getting fish. So SI is the efficiency index of labor agent A, and it's positive. Um, UI are just traditional quasi-concave quasi differentiable utility functions over output and labor. And F is a concave and differentiable production function that gives aggregate fishing in this economy. And aggregate fishing depends on the aggregate efficient amount of, sorry, uh, aggregate amount of labor inefficiency units expended. So um, normalize everything. Since these are just numbers, you just normalize stuff and you just focus on the simpler. So we get rid of these efficiency um, indices and just focus on straight utility functions and the production function here. So imagine this space of economies. It's just not one. There could be many lakes. So call all these economies, the set of all these economies as E, and fix the number of people. FE is the set of feasible allocations in any given economy. So tell me the economy, I tell you what you can do. So for example, if you have different production functions. An allocation rule is what? For any economy, it tells you the kind of things that are feasible um, in this particular economy. And a game form is a mapping that tells you for any given labor, even every given amount, uh, vector of efforts or labor in the economy, and a feasible allocation. This is useful because you want to get rid of the uh, output component. So everything is determined by um, labor. Now, well, this is just technicalities, but the idea is that the payoff that people get is essentially determined by the gain form. So you have a given allocation, so for any given amount of labor, both labor and output, and how these things are distributed is determined, and therefore people's um, utility. Now, suppose K, G, E, determines the Kantian equilibria of the gain G with associated utility functions at a given economy E. We say that a game form G, Kantian implements an allocation rule theta if all the Kantian um, equilibria are um, given by this allocation rule. And it fully Kantian implements if they correspond, actually. So for example, if you, uh, the allocation rule says whatever the uh, vector of labor, people get output proportionally. This should, ring a bell, then your theta is a proportional solution. And forget about this for a second. So this was proposed by Roma with a co-author in 93 in a JET paper. And it says, well, what is a proportional solution? It's a way of distributing fish in the following way. We want output and labor to be Pareto efficient, and we want people to get output, the amount of fish, in proportion to the labor they've expended. Now, this this thing here is virtually the same as this. This is individual amount. So this is the amount of fish that every individual gets. This is total amount of fish. This is individual labor expenditure, and this is total labor expenditure. So the amount of fish you get is a proportion of total fish, and the proportion depends on the amount of uh, labor you've expended. So this is a so-called proportional solution. And this is the relation with the exploitation index I mentioned to you. The interesting thing is, forget about this, this, that in the fishery game, in all these economies, the Kant, all of the Kantian equilibria correspond exactly to the proportional solution. So if people are Kantian optimizers, they will distribute fish according to the proportional rule, which in our paper before means that there is no exploitation. Not only that, if you have any Pareto efficient allocation, choose one, not just the proportional solution, any way of allocating fish and, expend and labor expenditure efficiently, and let G be a game where no output is wasted that implements a given allocation rule, as a Kantian equilibrium, then all such efficient allocation rules are proportional solutions. So the proportional solution is implemented by Kantian reasoning, and 
any um, Pareto efficient allocation you want to implement in a Kantian fashion is going to be precisely a proportional solution. Hence, the only Pareto efficient allocation rule that can be Kantian implemented is the proportional solution, is the no exploitation solution, which I thought also was kind of a cute and interesting result. Um, I'm going to skip the public good problem. It's going to take too much. So let me just jump to the conclusions. Um, so the Kantian equilibrium, I mean, in the paper by Roma, there, are a, a, a set, there is a set of other applications of the Kantian reasoning, for example, to the paradox of voting. Why do people go to vote? Perhaps people think in a Kantian fashion, and they ask, you know, would I want everyone to go to vote, essentially? Um, or there, is, there are you know, situations in which people contribute to a public good. That's also another possible application of Kantian reasoning. And in more recent work, uh, Roma has started to analyze also externalities deriving from social ethos. What if people maximize a convex combination between their own selfish welfare and their idea of social welfare? And again, the Kantian solution yields fairly surprising results. So what is the Kantian equilibrium? Well, it's a cooperative solution concept, which unifies several equilibrium concepts, such as the proportional solutions, for example. And the amazing thing is that Kantian equilibrium are Pareto efficient among the feasible allocations that can be achieved in a given game. Contrast this to the Nash solution. And you can, if you want to think about it, if you're Kantian, you are implicitly taking into account the effect of the externality. The surprising thing is that you take it into account in exactly the right way so as to rule out the inefficiency. So it's not trivial in the least that if you think as a Kantian, this will automatically uh, lead to no inefficiencies. The surprising thing is that if you, if you adopt a Kantian reasoning, the way in which you internalize the externalities associated with your behavior is exactly the right one to rule out the inefficiencies. So again, I guess for a set of PhD students, highlighting the possible road ahead is interesting. So note that the focus here has been on changes, the counterfactuals involved, where what if everyone increases their uh, labor contribution by 10%? Why 10%? Why not plus X hours? So it would be interesting to explore more general perturbations, and this is in some unpublished stuff by Roma, but there's a lot to be done. I mean, uh, there's probably a very general all-encompassing notion of Kantian equilibrium, which contains multiplicative, additive, and other sorts of um, counterfactuals, especially effects, and that's there to be found. So if you want to write a very good paper, this is one. Um, Analyze Kantian equilibrium when people actually think with a social ethos, as I mentioned, you know, when people take into account um, social welfare as part of their um, uh, maximizing process. But another interesting thing is, can, is there a way, is there a non-cooperative way of implementing Kantian equilibrium? This is not obvious. There is some literature on the implementation of the proportional solution, but this is a huge open question. So. How can we get there? And finally, how do Kantian equilibria em emerge? Can we build up a dynamic story whereby people, for example, learn by um, uh, mistakes how to get to a Kantian equilibrium, just like people have tried to do the same with Nash unsuccessfully? Um, I mean, think about the Kurno type story behind um, um, you know, how, people, how firms end up at the kuno nash equilibrium, that there is a dynamic explanation to it. In general, it's much more complicated outside of the Kurno game, but maybe here uh, one could figure out something, um, some dynamic story. And I think only six minutes, that's not too bad, above the hour. That's it, yeah. Uh, so thank you. You said that um, well that.
this Kantian equilibrium works really nice with the tragedy of the commons problem because there you have basically continuous strategies, right? You can decide how many boats you want to send uh, on the lake. Yeah. But how does this work when you have zero one decisions, uh, when you have a binary problem? For example, when I contemplate going to this conference here and I take this criterion, I ask myself, would I want everybody to, do, to go to this conference? Of course not. Maybe with six billion people here, it's maybe a bit too busy. Yeah. And, but would I want to go nobody? Maybe not either, because then, I mean, there are nice presenters and when nobody's listening, it's a waste of time. So how does this work when you have binary decisions? Um, if you have binary decisions, uh, the existence of Nash is not guaranteed. We know that. In order to prove the existence of Nash, you have to use random. Uh, you know, otherwise, you can't apply the usual, you know, the fixed point theorems. This is well known. Same thing here. I mean, in order to prove, typically you need compact, nice, spaces in order to get your, um, so it's not unique to this. So my answer to your problem would be typically, well, it's, it's twofold. First of all, keep in mind we fixed N, whereas in your example, you are changing the number of players. And the second answer is randomize. So just like we do with mixed strategies in the Nash reasoning, this is what we've done, for example, in the corporate defect type story of the prisoner's dilemma. So your question as a Kantian would be, you know, would I want everyone to increase their probability, well, everyone of the fixed number of players to increase the probability of going there by a factor, you know, 0.1? Okay. Thanks. Is it on? Yeah. Um, what I'm wondering about is of comparing the Kantian equilibrium with the one shot prisoner's dilemma. I guess we'll have to see if it uh, follows from the data, but the explanation behind it in the paper was uh, if you don't want something to happen to you, you should also not do it. But then that doesn't work in a one-shot game. So Why? Well, because the, the thing, like if you don't want the others to do it, you can always know that they won't know what you do until the game has been played. Right, but th you think ex ante. I mean, these things you actually always think of ex ante. So you're not asked, in, in a Kantian type story here, you're not asked to put yourself in the shoes of the other prisoner. You're saying, well, would I want both of us to decrease the probability of cooperating by a factor of a half? Mm -hmm. And then this is the kind of question you ask yourself. And you say, well, no, I don't want both of us to actually defect yeah. with probability of a half. But I'm just wondering whether you would use that reasoning in a one-shot game. Why not? Because you always know that you can um, do it yourself whatever you want, and the other one does not know what you do. But then you're not thinking as a Kantian. You're thinking, so yeah. what you're, your so objection is people don't think that follow. way. Yeah. Well, in a prisoner's dilemma, I mean, I mean, honestly, can you think of a convict behaving like a Kantian person? I cannot. I mean, these are people who've been, I don't know, caught murdering people and all of a sudden they go like, oh, the ethical imperative and stuff like that. They're not going to do it, obviously. But the prisoner's dilemma has a very general structure in which, which applies, for example, for, um, to um, think about recycling, right? Recycling is the typical situation in which the cost of being, the probability of being caught, so even there are some fines. Uh, so if you don't recycle in places where recycling is compulsory, you can be fined. Okay? However, if you think about it, there is no way in which pure selfish maximization explains the amount um, of recycling in most economies. Because if you just do a Nash type thing or an autarkic, more precisely, reasoning there, the probability of being caught is zero. And even so, typically, it's not, you're not individually fined if you live in a block of flats. It's everyone, right? So our theory, you know, the Nash reasoning would be, you know, do it. Who cares? You know, if it costs you even a tiny amount to recycle, just dump everything down. And yet people don't do that. Not only that, but you have parents telling their kids, oh, would you like everyone to do that? Yeah, so we should see it as a concept that can explain some behavior that is not explained by Nash. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, there is a limit to which you can rely on people's Kantian or in general cooperative behavior. So I entirely agree with you. But yet, I mean, a lot of behavior there is not explained by Nash, and a huge amount. Um, 
maybe this is more a question towards uh, Roma's choice of words. I find that uh, the the Kantian as an adjective is slightly a misnomer because Kant's ethics are uh, sort of de de deontic, and yeah. that they they talk about the categorical imperative being I I can have an action which is ethical if and only if the principle or the maxim uh, underlying my can action be can be sort of uh, the rule in this uh, um, I think in this uh, end of um, I think well basically you can you can call it heaven essentially whereas here um, we are looking at consequentialism uh, so not I think really but we we are evaluating things by their payoffs rather than <coughs> um, principles or maxims. But the way in which you think is deontological, right? It's the fact that you're multiplying everyone's actions by the same factor. I mean, my the my doubt with the Kantian um, definition is and something I mentioned here, and that is. You're not asking everyone to do the same in the sense of level. You're not asking whether the amount of labor you're putting in is something that you could advocate everyone to do. But you're saying, given whatever we're doing, would, we all want, would I want everyone to change in the same way? So in this sense, there is a difference with the, uh, with the Kantian imperative because you're not valuating actions, but rather changes to actions. So the Kantian element is in the counterfactual. I think it captures something, but as, as usual with the interpretations, there is a big uh, debate about you know, what does it capture and what does it not. So, um, but there is, I mean, I think it does capture some, something which is related to the categorical imperative, in, at least in the way people should think. I know I haven't convinced you, but you know. J. Roma at Yale. Edu. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering in that pond, if a really good fisherman shows up, does everyone else get screwed in this equilibrium because his effective labor is so high? Yeah, well, yes, because the labor is because, okay, uh, <laughs> it depends on exactly what you mean. In, in the following sense. Yeah, first of all, keep in mind that we are fixing the number of fishermen. So N is fixed. I, do, I have no theory here about, actually, this would be another interesting application. You know, what happens if you perturb the number of fishermen? Second part to the answer is, uh, in the fishermen's, um, in the lake example, the game is monotonically decreasing, according to the definition, um, in the sense that the, my payoff is strictly decreasing in the amount of labor that everybody else has put in. So in this sense, yes, they are screwed. So if you are, it's like you know, the addition of another player is equivalent to everyone increasing their uh, labor in this sense. Now the question is, what would, but again, the question is, is, this, I, is your question about a change in equilibrium? Is it a comparative statics exercise? Uh, is it what you have in mind? Because then, then the other question would be, what kind of reasoning does this um, uh, fisherman adopt? Because if this fisherman goes in and there's all this bunch of Kantian players and he's a Nash player, he goes in there and then says, okay, you all guys do your Kantian stuff. I go there and overfish. And then they are screwed in the second sense as well. Right. I guess I was thinking not in terms of the addition of a new player, but comparative statics, one pond with the superstar fisherman and one pond with just another, <clears throat> you know, regular fisherman. Superstar, is, uh, superstar has to do with these S's, these, um, you know, these things here. So the superstar guy is the one with the very high S. So this is already in here. Well, you could, yes, with everyone else having very low S's. It doesn't really matter. They still adopt the, if they think as Kantian optimizers, all of them, including the superstar, the superstar is going to have the higher share. Remember, we're talking about a proportional solution, so, which is this. 
So this guy is going to have a fairly big share. I think it kind of interacts with this question about fairness, you know, earlier that it it sort of doesn't solve every problem in no. some sense, but it's it's a very interesting it framework to think through these issues. I entirely agree. And again, keep in mind that we don't have a very good theory of implementation uh, as soon as you move into the externality dimension. And another thing which I found extremely surprising is, again, with Kant, you implement this, and this is the zero exploitation solution according to this. It's exactly the same thing. So Kantian fishermen are Marxist fishermen. Yeah, it's probably a good uh, way of closing. It's a nice line. <laughs>